So every year the board comes together to um, establish goals for the coming school <coughs> year. Um, this year the, if you pan those this way for me, just three, four. Um, this year it's a little different, feels a little personal because one of the largest goals for the board and for the community um, will be the hiring of superintendent because my retirement date is January 6th. And I will be retiring with a very heavy heart, but I did spend about seven days with my fabulous granddaughter, which made it a little easier this summer because she's about as cute as they come. So um, I'm just starting us off, taking us through um, a very brief review of our goals. We've had, I have been here five years, and I, when I started to do a review of the board goals um, over the last five years, we've had a very, very busy five years. Um, and I think the Board of Education here at Sag Harbor, um, that is not unique to the board uh, for the last five years, because prior to my starting here, the board was looking at um, a building project. So my predecessor, Carl Benuso, had been looking at um, the implementation of a bond project, and that was a lot of work for the Board of Education and for Dr. Benuso. Prior to that, Dr. Grotto had been working with the Board of Education and the administrative team um, reviewing international baccalaureate and bringing that to the Sag Harbor School District and then contemplating the middle school years. So when I look back, um, I didn't go back five years, I went back four years, and I didn't do all of the years because I promised to keep this brief. Um, so this evening's agenda is review of the progress toward the uh, Board of Education goals for the last four years by uh, myself, the superintendent. Every goal and task could not be reviewed, um, thus the superintendent will briefly provide a deep dive on specific goals and tasks over the past uh, five years. Next, identify future uh, district goals or tasks and prioritize what goals and tasks are year one, two, and three because no district can really r realize their goals or even their tasks in a single year. So for example, if we take the International Baccalaureate, that was an idea formulated um, with and by parents, administrators, and the Board of Education. The idea was formulated. People went out to uh, districts that had international baccalaureate. They spoke to administrators, board members, students, teachers, and they did their deep dive on that and then eventually brought it here with a lot of training and a lot of work. Um, we, had, we had the real, I think we really saw that come through where over 50% of our students last year um, in a grade level were part of the International Baccalaureate. I don't think we'll see that kind of sustaining year to year, but I think it really shows that um, our community and our parents and our board and our administrators have embraced that program. Another great example is that when we started with the International Baccalaureate program, um, at my beginning, and with the Board of Education and the administrators and the faculty and staff was to bring on the middle school years program. However, um, like the Mad Hatter's Tea Party, we changed the rules as they went along and they had brought in much more testing and much more um, uh, bringing in where they were gonna check with the students along the way. And at the same time, our own community was chafing under um, the Common Core standards and the testing being tied to teachers, and they, more testing wasn't something we felt, felt was gonna resonate very well, not only with our community, but would be good for our, our middle school, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. That testing them along the way was not something that we wanted to add to our middle schoolers' uh, curriculum. So instead, um, again, as time went on, um, our, our leadership came to our board and said, let's take this back to our teachers and to our students and they built what we call the plant curriculum, which had its first very successful, successful implementation this past year. And then next year that will grow into the seventh grade, continue being implemented in the sixth grade with tweaking, and then sustain onward into the eighth grade. Um, and again, without really building towards our children being ready for not only international baccalaureate, but for the years ahead, 
as strong students and strong commu uh, community members and citizens. Um, so I'm not going to go through again all of the, uh, these are from 1516, but the deep dive in that, and I think was communication to, and the board goal was implement and improve communication strategies to become an engaged and active pathways for school, community, through newsletters, emails, phone calls, videotaping, and launching. In the first year we started here, my very first board meeting, we began videotaping the board meetings. All board meetings, unless the board meeting were to go directly, let's say, into an executive session. But other than that, workshops and board meetings in the last five years have been videotaped, and you can find those on our website. Um, and they are also shown on channel 22 um, at any time during the week. Um, so we added technology upgrades to enhance communication. Um, so this include um, a one-touch touch lockdown buttoning system for communication for safety. So for instance, if we have a lockdown in the building, we can touch one button <coughs> that is by any of the administrator's desks, and it'll say we're now on a lockdown. If we are practicing a lockdown, which is so important for children, um, if you're in this building, you will hear Mr. Nichols' voice saying we're now on a lockdown. We don't have to go find Mr. Nichols. Or if you're in the elementary building, we'll have Mr. Malone's voice come on. So uh, we also um, have blue strobe lights that come on outside to let folks know. We also have an immediate um, system that goes out to alert um, our, our police and our parents to what's happening. Um, uh, communication panels near the main office, cafeteria, and gym have been installed for not only communication emergency systems, but everyday communication for everything from practice times when clubs are meeting, um, when colleges are coming, um, for volunteer um, activities, Jer John Germain activities. Um, so all of those, we've been trying from pretty much every approach how to increase communication. So these are what those communication boards look like. There's 15 of them throughout the building starting up on the third floor in the students' lockers all the way down to the cafeteria. And so anything that's gonna be on the daily announcements also arrives on these boards. We also try and show celebrations. Um, so not only will we have a blood drive announced, but we'll also have, if the students have had um, been away at, let's say, Model UN, we'll make sure that those pictures go up. Um, we'll even show things from the elementary as well. So here's more pictures of the communication board. Um, Distance learning was another thing that we now have students going all over the world for distance learning in the elementary school. Another way of enhancing our communication not only within the district, but also out to other parts of the world to meet the Common Core or now our next generation standards. Um, we've also been able to do some of our planning meetings across the distance learning. Um, I think we're launching our first distance learning um, class this year. We are going to be doing pre-calculus. Um, with students that will be taking that at Stanford Central School in upstate New York. And I happen to know that teacher and she's outstanding. Um, we also uh, did much more communication of our building's condition survey where we actually literally took pictures of every single piece of, so communication was not only that, but of what we needed to look at and know that had to be done. I know that's a lot of fast talking, 15, 16, we did uh, safety management, so write and implement safety plan, train all personnel, um, implement the use. Again, I'm trying to pick ones that were kind of resonating in our community. So we wrote safety plans for both buildings. Those are confidential, so folks can't look at those. We shared and worked with our chief of police. Now we've done that every year. We've enhanced that. Uh, and I'll update this since then, but this was, um, we also started working, um, I meet every other month with the entire East Hampton um, uh, chiefs of police from uh, the towns, the villages, from Sag Harbor police um, to constantly be updating. And we send other members of our safety team up island for more of those. But we wrote a safety plan that met the criteria of New York State Police. That's also shared with State Ed. Um, we also conduct lockdown <coughs> drills. We're in a different <coughs> world now. One of the things they know keeps our children the safest is to have simulations so they know what to do and what to expect. Um, we do trainings um, in how to use the equipment. Um, we are 
so lucky to have the police um, who will that have now. So if we have a lockdown, they have these, and if the building's locked down for the police, these begin to work. The police also have access to our cameras, so if we're in an uh, emergency situation, our cameras become live to them. They can see our floor plans. They can see where our uh, our students are. Um, we met the New York State TAN standards for safety and training for our staff, and the plan we plan large events um, um, still need to be developed. So there's still some things we're still working on. As a matter of fact, one of my recommendations are is for a new safety entrance for the middle school, high school, for Sag Harbor moving forward on a planning level. So here's some pictures because those always make it a little more real. So we have the one of the things that I noticed when I came here is we didn't have. Our bus drivers, our custodians, one of the safest things is our child knowing who to go to, and who to go to is they all look uniform. So that's an example with our custodians, they have a, they have look a uniform. All of our technology folks are wearing, have similar black shirts, and our security all are emblazoned that they're security. Um, then we have the emergency touch buttons that would put us into an emergency situation just by touching them, the communication screens, and of course the safety entrances that are vital um, with the safety glass and these are what you can see on any one of the um, the screens for the administrators we can just run our cursor over and wherever you see a camera that camera lights up for us and we can see them and now the um, security personnel as of this august will be able to have um, they're like iPads, but they'll have these on them so that they can, if there's a door jar or if they want to look at any one of these cameras, they'll have those mobile for them at all times. Um, and this is what it looks like if you um, scroll over one of those pictures, and, and our monitors have these up all the time, but our, these are very, very clear pictures. Again, we also have ID tags for everyone, and these are what get them in and out of the building as well. Um, build, strengthen community partnerships. So very briefly, some of the built partnerships we've built for not only um, the, you'll see, well, we talked about it for diversity, um, uh, our diversity committee, but we also use it for our wellness committee. So these are some of our safe partners are the Wellness Foundation, Community Coalition, Family Service League, YMCA, John Jermaine Library, and our key communicators. Um, find ways to start school early. That started a long time ago, and two, twice we moved the start time later um, because of the research around that being um, healthy for children. And those were led through multiple meetings over a three-year period. And this is one of the examples of one of the meetings that was led by Jeff Nichols and Matt Malone that just focused on athletic programming, and that was as far back as 2017. But we actually started the meetings in 2014-2015. Um, these are, this is an example from the event. We took all of our wellness programming um, and worked to enhance it. And that year we were working on the dimensions of wellness mm -hmm. because we rewrote our wellness um, uh, policy. And so we focused on the seven dimensions of wellness. And this is an example. I'm not going to go through all of them. But all of the things, uh, the clubs, the organizations, some of them we had, some of them we enhanced. So that was physical wellness, intellectual wellness. Again, the more Velcro a child feels to school, the more opportunities they have to access things like the Rudishan Trust that was here all, all summer long, the less likely they are to abandon school and to feel a part of it. It reduces their stress level. Occupational wellness. So again, workshops, having um, things like Model UN, having things like the coding clubs, um, environmental wellness. Uh, so, uh, social wellness. So the iTry program that's in middle school has really taken off. We had, um, you know, five years ago we had just a few. Now we have a tremendous showing for, of girls that, and, and young men that also take part, and they learn to run a triathlon by swimming, biking, and running. Um, they also take part in photo shoots. They spend the whole year learning how, about how to eat right, um, how to take care of uh, themselves, and also how to volunteer in their community. 
and large, large group of things that students do for their community as well. Um, and emotional wellness, everything from stress management workshops to clubs and organizations, uh, empowerment training, and spiritual wellness. We've been doing a lot in the middle school on meditation and on brain breaks. Um, so also one of the things I'd like to focus on is that um, we, uh, we had a goal for uh, STEM offerings, and so now if you go all the way down at the elementary school, you will see them having little bits, little tiny little bits. And when we say bits, they actually can um, make circuitry starting in kindergarten. Well, they'll put the circuitry together and they make small machines and they make robots. And um, they can go all the way up to uh, uh, Legos that also make um, all kinds of machines. And so those are some of the starting, starting off points they have. And they also have a robotics club in elementary school, an engineering club in ele elementary school, moving up to coding, girls that code. Um, and we also have middle school um, robotics team and a pristine high school robotics team that was one of the first robotics teams in, on Long Island that this year had record-breaking numbers of students participating and a very large number of females participating, which is that pushing that nice gender norm, I like to see. Um, so one of the other examples is we, uh, there was an, they were asked to enhance college so these are just some of the things that we've added in the last five or six years. College application, which is two part. We bring students in during the day to work on their essay writing before the school year starts. We have financial aid nights for both parents and students. Admissions nights, we have, um, we've had a gentleman come back a few times that talks about the admission game to understand what parents are up against when they're, or, and students when they're applying. College night, um, which also includes tech programming as well. Um, don't press send and other social media. We had a student that did their international bachelor baccalaureate program where they had a series of nights for parents to understand the apps that their students had on their cell phones. We had uh, security night updates, IB introduction nights that happen every year along with middle school orientation nights for fifth grade parents, welcome nights um, for, for middle school parents and students along with the middle school orientation. <laughs> And preschool, we can't, um, preschool and ki kindergarten, I kind of left the elementary out, but I, they, um, forgive me, Mr. Malone, if I've left you out. Um, I also mentioned Rudishan Trust, they couldn't be going stronger. Um, they've been here five to seven at night and almost every single day and in the elementary as well. Uh, another one, su successful imp implementation of the bond, including Proposition 2, which was developed the athletic fields and secure the bids. Now this was the, so athletic, so we had two bond, bond propositions. One was all the parking lots, the auditorium, um, the, uh, the other work that was gonna, and then there was a second bond proposition from the 2013 that said, we're gonna put a synthetic turf field in. A little sensitive issue here. And when it came to implement it, it was going to be more expensive to implement. And at that point, the community, it appeared, had changed their feelings because we have a lot of very, very vocal meetings with people not wanting a synthetic turf field. So um, we eventually brought it to a proposition in December 14, 2016, um, and we were going to require extra funding. And what the community voted on was did they want us to go back to the Capital Reserve and vote on that? So I only bring this up to say the board's done a lot of work. This was a lot of work. And this was no small amount of listening and learning from the community. But we brought it to the community for a vote after going out and doing a lot of discussing and sharing. The community came in with a resounding no. It was 135 yes to 1,016 no. They did not want to go into the Capital Reserve. Well, that wasn't simple because then we had to go because you can't change purpose when you've had an original vote. So we had to sign, the governor had to sign the legislation into law in December 16 to expand the proceeds of the bond to use it for something else. So it had to stay athletic in nature, but could we use it for something else? And voter approval is still required. Um, the voters did, we, um, 
The grass reconstruction of the Pearson field plus the athletic play field in the elementary was designed. So the grass field out here and with the scoreboard and then the elementary field with the uh, new playing field, new multi-purpose court and the new um, uh, uh, plaza was all part of using the, what was originally for the turf, uh, the, the turf field. And so those uh, were put into use. And this is the, the progress of, of bringing it all down, putting in irrigation. And that was the result. And we also put in safety steps as well. Because when you used to be able to get leave the gymnasium, you were wa walking down just pebbles and, and grass. And said there's nice safety steps now. We had a community forum <coughs> about the uh, elementary school <coughs> and grass field for the vote, and that was this is what they got: the plaza, the grass field, and the multi-purpose court. And this is what it used to look like. This is what the uh, old basketball court used to look like. And this is the new elementary field. I'm sorry I didn't put in the multi-purpose court, but if you haven't seen it, go see it. It's beautiful. And so that is my brief overview of just a few of the things that we focused on over the years. I hope I didn't put anybody to sleep, but those are just some deep dives into what we've done. Um, one of the things I, I regret leaving out is we did put, that still stays there, is how do we measure our students' success? And what, the, what we brought to the board is that we measure success through formative assessments and through summative assessments. Summative is reaching a summit, right? We reach a summit and then we go from there. So summative assessments are the end product. So those are your IB exams. Those are your Regents exams. Those are your 3 3 testing. Those are your SATs. But one of the things we brought to the board and tried to edify the board on is we also do formative assessments with a kinder, gentler progress monitoring monitoring on how our students are doing. And we brought in things like Montes and Canal, which check our students' reading measuring, all the way from kindergarten to fifth grade. We do Math Excel in the middle school, which monitors how our students are progressing in their math acquisition, right? So we've done all these, we've done, we've done um, AIMSWeb, which again is this monitoring of math and, and their language acquisition and their reading acquisition. So those are some things, and then we have to come back and say, what would you like us to measure? So these are some deep dives. I hope I didn't put anybody to sleep, but I like to do it too, okay? Still yeah. awake. Okay, good, good. Again, I didn't want to go through every single thing. If you have questions on any of them, you've looked at them a lot, you know? Um, Chris has been here, Chris Tice has been here since the very beginning. Um, there's, there's, you know, you've been here you know, as also as uh, community members, our administrators have been here through these. If you have some deeper dives you want, but I've left you with what you have in front of you is what I think we can remove and what, where I think we need to go from here. You guys want to hand those down. And so the things that I, I think we can remove. So the task one is the, which you, I think you'll talk about tonight which is uh, work with school leadership to find an exceptional educational leader to meet Sag Harbor Schools specific characteristics identified by stakeholders in the school and community and effectively um, communicate the search process and expectations and develop and implement a transition plan to ensure the success of a new superintendent. A lot of the items in, in two uh, are continuing monitoring and I did add planning and implement a safety entrance for Pearson Middle School to match what we have at the elementary school. Again, that would be um, a plan that the board and the administration would put into place that would, put, that would have to have a, a vote. Again, item three was continue to expand, continue to revise, implement and revise, and then implement the, the newly revised fundraising policy. Number four, I think that we've We've completed that. And then on the back, I think for developing communication plans for the Sag Harbor Learning, I think A, B, and C, I think we've completed. And D, E, and F are before us. And I hope to have a lot of those done so that your next superintendent can really focus <coughs> on listening and learning and getting to know the community. 
um, and the students and the school. So that I hope that I'll work very hard to get that um, accomplished with our our team and with the Board of Education. How are we doing? Any questions? How are we doing? Good? Great. Okay. We're not workshopping like we normally do because workshop can can create additional goals and I think that we I think we want to be very careful about not creating anything more than, you know, I always have this wonderful line for especially new teachers. You can take a very, very competent, very talented person and quickly make them incompetent and feel not very talented if you give them too much, too much to do. My ex-husband is a fabulous, fabulous golfer. And when he would take, you know, anyone out golfing, he said, focus on three things. You know, maybe it's their swing, maybe it's their stance, maybe it's their follow through. But if you give them more than three things, their golf game is not, they, they will lose their focus. So we want that person to really be able to focus. Can I ask a point of clarification? I thought we were workshopping goals tonight. Are we not doing that? No, we, we are, so. Okay, because um, it sounds like it's. No, we used, used to, we used to hang up. We're well, right, I mean, we should have, I mean, we so should be, workshopping means it's interactive, yes, that it everyone participate. it is, so okay. I, but I misunderstood. So, excuse yes, me, so I'm not doing what I typically used to do, which was go out and say, give Katie Graves and the board every idea in, in the world by putting up lots of posters, watching lots of TED Talks, and see if we can percolate up as many new ideas as possible, because I think that could really, um, be a challenge for a new person to come to not only what is in front of them, but what's, you know, you know, a anything brand new. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I, I think it would be, um, you would make a competent person competent very fast. All right, so what, could you just share yeah, what so the structure of the yeah, event? I was just gonna get into it. It's a perfect segue. Awesome. Um, so, this was a really helpful overview of the goals that we've set in the past. So we know kind of some of them are overarching, some of them are very specific. We know what we've already tackled. Um, and then kind of seeing this red line of the goals that from last year and kind of what we need to add is helpful to see what's still left over. Um, so the idea was instead of starting with open-ended TED Talk, stickers, get to know you, trust game type things. Um, just kind of talk about, start with where we are and then open it up. Um, so now that Katie has done an awesome job of going through everything that we've been working on over the last few years, um, I think the, the structure is to now open it up to the administrators and you know get their thoughts on some of what they think are some of the priorities or if they have any um, you know, concerns or cautionary tales about certain, you know, types of goals, um, and then, you know, open it up to all of us, all of you guys back there and the board, and we can all discuss and have a real workshop. So that, is there anyone, anyone, any of the administrators who guys want to go for it? I'll, I'll, I'll go for it. <laughs> So um, at the elementary school, and I, and I think this is um, from our talks in, at the cabinet level, this is aligned with um, what all the administrators have been um, focusing on, not just last year, but prior years. I, I believe these goals, these, the larger goals, have been a great guide for us. Um, so at the elementary school, like if I look carefully at goal two, um, one of the things that we've been very proud of is the um, character education curriculum that's embedded in, in really everything we do at the elementary school, but in particular um, at morning program. It's definitely a focus of, of the discussions that we have each morning with the kids with the hope that that you know, then permeates throughout the building. But um, Ms. Reynoso, myself, um, other teachers in the building, but in addition to that, our, our PTA, um, also some support from the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. In recent years, we've, we've talked about the possible need for a more specific program that we could, say at first, utilize with groups of children that might need additional support. 
So um, one program that's been identified is known as the um, Dovetail Toolbox. And I think the, um, the group at the elementary school really sees a lot of strength in that program. So our goal this coming year is to send a team for some training or possibly utilize the distance learning to get some in-depth training in that program, make sure that it would be a fit for the school, and then um, if the timeline goes properly, then pilot that with some constituents, say in the spring, reevaluate in the summer, and then possibly um, expand the use of it in the coming years. So that would be a goal aligned with, um, with goal two. And I guess I'll, I'll just hit my, my next um, piece while I'm talking. So I'm looking at goal three and the district accountability piece. Mrs. Graves spoke well, spoke well to the um, use of the formative assessments. We utilize AmesWeb and we have four, uh, could be, it's definitely five plus years and we've utilized it um, in the specific area of language arts. And it's been, it's been helpful data to not just identify children that are at risk, but to ensure that children are progressing at the rate that we want them to and continuing that on through. Um, this year, the actual Ames Web platform is changing. Um, they're working to become better aligned with the next generation standards. And we've um, been happy with that because now the mathematics probes that are available with Ames Web are better aligned with what we do at the at the building level. So in this coming year, we're going to train the staff in the new platform, and then also use AIMSWeb, not just for ELA, but to use it as a um, benchmarking in mathematics. So we think that's going to bolster our data collection and data analysis to support the kids. That's really cool, because that's actually something, I mean, when Katie was talking about measuring success, that was something that came out of our um, board evaluation and board retreat, was some, you know, some themes were kind of focused, doubling down on academics after all these bond projects and stuff, and so, right. you know, how do you focus on the academics without knowing where we are, and we've had all of these great reports from, from you guys over the year about all this data, but then we don't know where we want to get to, sure. right. and just, but we all discuss kind of how we all want to see more data-driven analysis, sure. so that'll be really cool. Yeah, so what, you know, something like the AIMSWeb, um, and being that it'll be, it'll be a, new, a newer platform for all of us at the elementary school, I would, I would say at some point, you know, mid-year, that would be a great um, opportunity for us to come back to you, let you know how the data is helpful to us, if there's any areas that we're not happy with. Um, I think it would be good for all of us to talk about. So for the middle school, high school, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the high school. Ms. Carriero, feel free to jump in, uh, Mr. Guinan as well. Um, so one of the challenges that we've talked about uh, this summer is balancing the increased enrollment in the IB program uh, with maintaining a high level of achievement. Um, so this past year, the diploma class uh, was close to 50% of the graduating class, uh, which was a goal that we had set uh, when we first introduced the program six or seven years ago was to, to increase the uh, percentage of students who access the full IB diploma program. Um, with achieving that goal, though, we have run into some challenges in terms of maintaining the performance level. So um, we've received the results back, um, and, and this is nothing new. We do this every year uh, with Regents assessments, with New York State 3 through 8 assessments, although they're not quite as valid because of the opt-out uh, AP results in the past and present. Um, so what we'll be doing this year is looking at those results, identifying areas of strength and weakness, and then targeting professional development um, to bolster the areas that we think we need to improve upon. Uh, in the past, this process, if you will, has uh, gone beyond professional development to include structural changes to the schedule uh, where it made sense. So if you go back maybe five or six years ago, um, maybe it was four or five years ago, we had seen a pattern develop in mathematics where in that discipline we weren't performing academically at the level we were in the other disciplines. 
Um, so we made some structural changes to the schedule and actually increased math instructional time by 100% in sixth grade and by 50% in seventh grade. Uh, and actually changed our acceleration model at that time in terms of percentages of students going forward. And we also introduced some software programs. So with regard to IB, um, we'll be doing a lot of those things over the course of this year. Um, the other area that, and so that would really be aligned with goal number um, three. Um, Ms. Carriero can probably talk a little bit about the plant program and any changes you might have. Yeah, so the plant's to gonna that. continue on. I sent out an email actually today because we had trouble scheduling plant two in eSchool, but we are continuing it. Um, and Mr. Molly, who's here, and a bunch of other teachers are working as a think tank, and it is a homegrown program, but I have to say, it's gone above and beyond what we ever thought it was going to be, so we're excited about it, and we'll continue planning that for this year, just make sure that in eighth grade that we have that dissertation model that we, um, that Mr. Molly and Ms. Westoff has presented to you guys, where the eighth grade will actually do a research project, give a dissertation to the rest of their um, peers, as well as their parents, so we're excited about that. And then also how we're going to roll it in and spiral it into different disciplines, not just the plant class, which we have been continuing talking about during grade team meetings. So, and then just to touch upon what uh, Mr. Nichols mentioned about the enhancing of our increasing of in, um, instruction for math. So, like one of the great data points that we have this year for that is that the eighth grade, the lowest grade anyone got on the math, the algebra regions was an eight. So mastery is an 85, so that percentage is amazing for us, so we know that it's working now. Um, we had a little tweaks, but I think we're doing a really good job of making sure that our math program is continuing and increasing. So we have seen some growth as well. Um, before I go on to goal number two, just some, some thought. Uh, Mr. Guyon, do you have anything to add to my comments about IV? Yeah, I mean, we look at all of the courses that have summative assessment, IV, AP, Regions, and we have goals yearly for performance. So we're always looking at places where we're underperforming and trying to figure out why. That's, as Mr. Nichols said, that's a yearly practice. So I think we saw some areas of underperformance this year that we want to address through perhaps professional development, but also looking at how the teachers are collaborating internally and externally with other IV schools. Um, and also modes of instruction that are employed in the classroom. So we're going to be looking at some of that stuff and, and hope to support the teachers to, to meet the goals that we have for student performance. We also have a, a sort of, not this year, of uh, doing a deep dive on mathematics, and that already started last year because IB is changing the math course. Um, so we sent a bunch of teachers to training. We're collaborating externally with other uh, IB schools and um, with IB itself to try and figure out what makes the most sense for how we structure uh, starting next year and moving forward. I think with regard to, to goal number two in terms of wellness, that there's a variety of um, initiatives that I won't touch upon that the guidance department, the people personnel department, the teachers, and the administrators focus on uh, on an annual basis. But the two that have stood out to me over the last year, uh, and if I was to access the same um, path that I do with academics, which is to look at the previous year and identify areas that we need to improve upon or that are issues moving forward. Um, one of them is the vaping. Um, which certainly pertains to student wellness, and I think we need to do a better job of articulating to families um, and to students the, the dangers associated with that and do a better job of educating people. Uh, and the second, which is an ongoing <coughs> concern and it takes up a large part of our day, and I don't think it's going away, is the whole uh, issue of appropriate use of technology as it relates to social media and how we treat one another. And that's an ongoing um, process, if you will. So those are the two uh, key issues for me as it pertains to wellness. If, uh, Brittany or Mike, you want to? I just want to say about the social media, I do have to say in the middle school, not having the cell phones was a huge change, and actually you would see the different culture that was created within the classroom. So 
I feel like I didn't have as many social media stuff that actually happened in school. It might have happened outside of school where they talked about it, and yes, we have to follow up according to legislation, but it definitely had the children at a different level of less anxiety about did I miss a Snapchat text or DM or whatever it is that they're using, so which is good. Okay. So I can, I'll jump in next. Um, so, like Mr. Malone had said, I think this is a really nice framework that allows a lot of flexibility to prioritize some targeted outcomes. Um, I think uh, if I'm looking at the same goal two as goal three in task A, we're looking at post-secondary outcomes. So what are post-secondary outcomes for students with disabilities? How do we coordinate those activities all the way up since age 13, 14? Um, and looking at transition coordination and uh, leveraging um, local agencies to support students um, with their choices beyond high school. And that's one of the ways we can fit in PPS. Additionally, um, I really like to highlight tax, task C under three um, on the intervention. I'm gonna go back to what Mr. Malone was talking about with Ames Web. The other feature of Ames Web that will be introduced is that progress monitoring. So not only have that alignment with next generation, we really need that alignment of assessments with how we're going with curriculum. And when there's that gap, it gets really challenging to provide matched services and support. So that's, I'm excited about that. And that'll come back into your multi-tiered systems of support. And I would extend task C as a recommendation from elementary school all the way up to middle and high school. And we've already started doing some of that work with Ms. Carriero and I have already met and targeted some um, pieces at the middle school level with read, extra reading support by leveraging the master schedule. Um, so we've been able to be a little bit more creative with the master schedule. And also looking at needs across students, including students in the IB program with how we define what executive functioning is, getting homework and tasks done. We're looking at that in the middle school. And at the high school level, we've been working with Mr. Nichols on the math piece and how do we provide that support that's most efficient. So what we want to really want to do is make that smallest change with the biggest effect, right? Smallest feet change, and then also to match the interventions and supports. Um, the other thing that we're working on is trying to target what are those outcomes that we're looking at, and what are those measures that are going to tell us that we're on track with those outcomes. I know they've got it. Just nothing. Know, just I know. <laughs> That's awesome. I think mean, this is like so interesting to read, to kind of look at these goals through the context of, context of your eyes, because now we actually like can understand exactly what you want to do. Does anyone want to put on the floor? Or want to add anything before we open it up to the community for if there's anything missing or if there's anything that they want to prioritize? Okay. I mean, I just wanted to add. We have that discussion about giving a little more emphasis and focus on the academics. And I think maybe something we need to look into is whether we need to expand any of, of the programs, if the IP offerings right now are enough, or is it something we need to start looking into it, uh, things like that. Do you want us to speak to that right now? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think for a school our size, um, and that is roughly about 280 students, 9 through 12, we have a, we have a very, very wide range of course offerings. So I believe that in New York State we might be number the smallest or the second smallest school at the diploma. It depends year to year. I think we're the smallest. I think we're the smallest. So I feel very good about the breadth of offerings. And it is a challenge, and you guys have always been supportive of that. Um, with the breadth of offerings comes a commitment to run class sizes of five, six, seven, eight students. Um, and that's a challenge for us. Um, but I think it's a challenge that we can continue to meet as long as we have the board support. In terms of um, expanding the course offerings, I don't really see a need for the expansion of offerings without, without necessarily being thoughtful about um, the economy of it. In other words, taking other offerings away. So in other words, if we have 11 or 12 IB courses and AP courses, if we're going to take one of we're going to add something, we've got to be very judicious with making a decision as to what we're going to take away. Because I think we're very much at the limit, in my eyes, of what we can offer responsibly balancing a quality education with being responsible with taxpayer dollars. Because we could, if we add more courses, we could be down to two, three, four students per class. So 
that's a consideration to, to be aware of. I do think that the there is another uh, thought, which is what I said before, how do we increase participation in this gold standard program that right now is in 11th and 12th grade, which is the diploma program. And I think the answer to that is you think strategically about increasing rigor and preparation in grades that lead up to 11th and 12th grade. So those are, um, as Ms. Muir said, targeted interventions, but there are also honors programs, perhaps at younger grades, although we have to be very careful about that as well. Um, getting into the type of instruction that's utilized in grades six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, and making sure, or working towards making sure that that, that uh, instruction is aligned with what IB is going to be asking of students when they get to 11th and 12th grade and all that kind of work is sort of happening right now I believe that's not to say the work is done we need to continue to build on it uh, but going back to my original statement I think we'd have to be very thankful for the amount of course offerings that we have for such a small high school and be very very thoughtful about any expansion happening in a, in a in a manner that's uh, reasonable for what the community can sustain. Yeah, this fall we'll also be engaged in, an, in a self-evaluation process. So we'll be engaging you, uh, the board and the community, and the faculty and the students, um, in sort of taking stock of where IV has come up until now, um, what the lessons learned, what strengths there are in the program, and learn more about where we might be able to um, expand, but I agree with Jeff judiciously. So we'll learn a lot more about what's valued and um, where the opportunities lay. And the question it's... about that, the surveys, will that be about like, you know, would you rather take X than Y? Or will it also be about their experience in that particular course and do they feel like they were getting the support they need or that it was taught in a way that was engaging or will it ask about their specific experience of each class or just you know, would you rather we offer X instead of Y? Much more the latter than the former, but okay. asking some of those types of questions can provide different bits of information too, in terms of priorities and, and sort of sussing out what's valued most. Mm -hmm. But really we're interested in the experience students have and asking about that, and families too, so we okay. want to hear from Ivan parents and okay. teachers. I think the other thing to keep in mind um, and maybe I'm saying the obvious, but maybe I'm not, is that we do consider many, many data uh, with regard to measuring student success. So we've talked about IB and the increase in enrollment and the assessment results there, but this past year was our strongest uh, board score year, if you will, that we've ever had. So in a class of 65 kids, I think we were close to 20 students scoring 1,400 or higher which means that the work that we're doing um, leading up to 11th and 10th, 11th and 12th grade, both at the elementary school and middle school is showing tangible um, results. And so we've got to continue to monitor that. And we monitor that not only uh, in terms of just looking at it, but comparing it to how other districts uh, with similar demographics are doing, uh, but also with other districts that have different demographics than us that that are you know known nationally as very very high achieving so i believe this year on long island i think we were i think we were number 17 in terms of the mean sat that's nassau and suffolk county which and, and how many just to, so that for those that may not be aware there's a, there's a lot of districts right i mean out of that's out of uh, well, over 100 i think right so yeah. we're, we're like in the top 15 percent yes right yeah. And go ahead, Alex. No, I just I wanted to say a couple of things. Um, first of all, that's really great to hear. It says, I think, a lot about our teachers and administrators. Um, I also just wanted to say a, a couple of you mentioned social media use, something we all you know read about today and its impact on society. I know we're, we're talking about doing a lot of workshops this year, and that might not be a bad idea to have a workshop on that and give us a chance to hear from the administration and community members just generally about you know what's going on with social media use in, amongst the students and if there's anything more that we ought to be thinking about doing. So. If I 
I, if I may add as well, I feel compelled to speak about diversity and inclusion because our committee is bustling with activity and just to add to some of the goals which we could easily fall upon to A, B, and D. Um, our subcommittees, which are um, for film, tough topics, um, has met over the summer and we're in the process of scheduling a few uh, movies in advance of the school year starting so that there are set dates that the community will know about in advance of the events taking place. Um, we've also been very active in researching um, another part of the subcommittee is researching trainings, um, which speaks to Mr. Malone adding about dovetail learning and the toolbox, which came from our guest speaker, who was the superintendent's conference guest speaker last year, who recommended this program. Our PTA has been involved in researching this, as well as our subcommittee, in our hopes of building upon the social emotional learning piece for children, and the curriculum is K to six. So we're in the process of researching that to hopefully launch it for next school year. And um, the other is um, curriculum and books for our classroom libraries that we're also in the process of researching as well. And we've met over the summer. Um, so we're launching for the school year and have some set things in place that we're hoping to implement. Chris, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just, uh, I wanted, uh, and I appreciate all the input we've heard so far. I think that uh, some of the tasks that are still on this chart, I, I would challenge should still remain on there because I think we've, we're now operationalizing it. So once it becomes operationalized as kind of your ongoing year after year processes, it no longer really belongs as a task on your goal board. It's become operationalized. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to fill it in with five other things, but um, I think some of them have become operationalized, which is a great thing like the efforts of our you know, diversity committee. It was a subcommittee and one of the goals was to make it a committee and, and achieve certain things, but now it's a committee. So now that it's a committee, we wouldn't have it on, we wouldn't list all our committees and as, a, as a task to do under the goal. It's now become operationalized. So I would just suggest that we just pressure test that because I do think that there are several here that would just be you know, operation. Or every year you're gonna do this. Um, and, um, the other suggestion that I have is, uh, you know, we've talked about this a little bit. Are we doing enough for students who aren't college bound? And we live such a distance from BOCES that we are, we are geographically challenged, right? You know, if you're going to be really an active participant in BOCES, it makes it hard to be really engaged in a lot of the programs here. But I don't know if we do enough, I don't know if we do enough, maybe we do, to expose mm -hmm. our, our population, not just the students, but parents. I can't tell you how many people, parents I know, who know nothing about the BOCES programs and therefore wouldn't even know how to engage with their children in that discussion. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I think that we could do a better job of educating all of, the, of our community on what those opportunities are. Some of BOCES is trade, some of it's not trade. I mean, you can get your pilot's license in high school and then become a pilot. I think most people wouldn't think of that as a trade program, but you know, but that's a program that, that there are kids that have graduated from Pearson that have participated in. So I would I would I would suggest that that would be one of our goals is just to do or one of the tasks is just to do a better job of, of educating and implementing those options for students. So it is one of our goals mm -hmm. in this past year. Uh, I took the high school guidance counselor to see the BOCES programs. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to see how they operated. Mm -hmm. um, where the quality was, so I could be informed in coming back and promoting them. Mm -hmm. um, we have to do a better job in promoting the opportunities because there are some great ones. And to Jorgis's point, we measure student success not just in IB achievement, but in postgraduate success. Right. One of the things that I learned there was that the HVAC and carpentry programs are under-enrolled for the East End, which is crazy because that's where a lot of opportunity lay in terms of employment. Um, so we did a, a bit of uh, extra promoting of the programs through the high school orientation and stuff, but you're very right. We have to do a better job of getting the word out there um, yeah. and making sure families as well as students understand mm -hmm. the opportunities because they're good ones. Right. Um, the, the other um, question I had was, and I, I know I've brought this up before, is that we have kind of a tight curriculum, great offering, but tight, tight curriculum around core courses, right? There's a certain amount you have to have and certain things that have to be taught. 
but in many schools they, they leverage their electives to expand the, the student opportunity and it's see I don't know if our electives have changed a lot in the, the 10 years I've been on the board I have I you know through my three kids I haven't seen a lot of changes but I would challenge us to say are there areas of opportunity through the elective selection that could expose our students to other areas that may have career opportunities or academic academic interests that they just aren't exposed to now. And I know part of that is just based on what our staff is qualified to teach or interested to teach through the elective yeah. options. I think, it's, but I think it's really also a balance because mm -hmm. you've got to appeal to the whole um, student population. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, we've added, and you know this, we've added the AP um, computer science and IB computer science over the last five or six mm -hmm. years, which is a new course of study for kids that we didn't have six or seven years ago. Um, but in adding that, um, we've got to look at the other course offerings that we had seven or eight years ago, like business mm -hmm. or accounting. And one, one goes out and another one comes in. So if we're going to add, let's say, another, C another course in computer science, the decision practically for us is do we, you know, what do we do with AP government? Yeah. Do, we, do we hold on to AP government, which mm -hmm. is more valuable? Because you're dealing with a, um, a limited, uh, uh, you, don't have a, you, don't, you don't have unlimited resources, if you will. No, absolutely. You've also got to go back to the community and say, hey, you know, there are six students enrolled in this course. <laughs> Can we exactly. rationalize that? Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. Well, that ties into my third suggestion, and um, this is more kind of a best practices that's recommended when you're doing goal setting on a district level. Is like you want to do the data gap, gap analysis. You you know you want to go through district data, trend data, perceptual data, do SWOT analysis. That there's kind of an analytical process, and it's not just test scores. That in a lot of districts there's surveys and there's other things they leverage, and. Um, I think that, that we do some of it, but I don't think as a district we're that disciplined that we do this on a regular basis and that we operationalize it. The administrators might, but as a board member I'm unaware of it and I'm guessing the community is. So I think as a, as a lens to look through and how we approach a lot of it, we could do a better job of being more analytical, of making more database decisions, and of really identifying that as we proceed through the goal setting process. So for instance, even with the electives, you know, a lot of districts will survey the students, and then at least they'll have a set. Now, again, you know, you don't want to have, if you survey them every six months, you can't be a ping pong changing it, you know, every six months on the whim of the population, but, but getting a pulse of what their interest is and saying, okay, if we're going to, you know, if we can only offer six, but we, we have staff that could teach up to these ten subjects, do we really know what six the students are most interested in? So, you know, I would just, I'm just using that as an example, but I would encourage us to really really be a little bit more um, objective and data driven on this stuff. And I, as a board member and a community member, I'd love to see more of that data. I mean, we've talked about a dashboard or a report card, but we haven't created one in the district in a very long time. And then that becomes what you look at year over year and you may, things may slide in or out, but we're not systematic about, about looking at, at our district that way. And, and, you know, high performing districts generally do that and it's the best practice that's recommended. So Chris, are you saying that we don't, I, I want to make sure I understand what you just said, because I think I might, might not be understanding it. Mm -hmm. Are you suggesting that with regard to like assessment results, we don't um, systematically or in a systematic way look at our progress over a period of time, or are you referring to other measures that we don't access? I think in a point of time we look at that particular data set. Uh -huh. What I don't I, I haven't seen us do as a district is there are districts that will have like a report card with five different data sets and it's a snapshot and year over year you can look at those and say okay it's kind of multi-dimensional over a variety of things we kind of do a point in time of here's a data set let's look at this and then here's something let's look at that and there may be two or three of those over the course of the year we look at so what's a concrete example of what you're referring to because I'm thinking of the assessment results that are mm -hmm. longitudinal in nature that we spread out over five years by discipline Right. And even by even course. Yeah. Right. So are I'm you? Sorry. It's even more than five years. Yeah. Yeah, it goes so back. What, so what are you referring to? Yeah. Other measures? Right, so there may be other measures, whether it's graduation rate. So that becomes something else. Whether it's percentage that go to college or not. And I'm just throwing ones out there that some other districts use. All but right. they kind of create a snapshot 
that includes a lot of different data points that they monitor over a piece of time. And it's, I call it a report card because some districts do. Katie has referred to it as a dashboard. Right. But well, the state, the state does what you're talking about. In other words, the, the state report card me measures many of the things you're referencing, right. but I still think it's a good idea to Yeah, to, just to look own. at and discuss and make sure, sure that we understand it, that the community understands where we are, and that that becomes kind of a little bit of a leverage point. But even coming into to this exercise, that goal setting in a lot of districts, they will look at a variety of data and then say, okay, here are, you know, here's a lot of our success, here's some of our pain points, and they're just a little bit more methodical about that. Right. Um, that's all. Yeah. It sounds like maybe the idea is to formalize the set of metrics over time that we as a community want to look at. Is that what you're saying? Well, that, that was a goal for the past two years that we Right, I but it's, it's the how do you measure success goal that we never actually figured out how to go about it was doing never, it. It was, so never, it was never accomplished that I'm aware of that it became a, became formalized. Well, we may be doing it kind of I, yeah, um, I, I on a daily that, I basis. I think that we looked at what I think we, we edified the board to, or, you know, um, we what we shared with the board was here are the ways that we, here are the summative, summative assessments we look at. We look at SAT, we look at... Regents exams, we look at ACT exams. So here are all the things we look at in oh, N3 through 8. And we, we've really gone to the granular level. So for example, on 3 through 8, through eight we not only look at the percentage pass, but we go down as far as, as some of the cohort examples that nobody else looks at, um, which you've gotten to look at because we go down to the county, to the school, to the neighboring school districts level, um, which Brittany gets to do from now on. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, and then we also, um, over the last two years, have expanded, like Pontus and Pinnell was just at K-1-2, I think, and then we, we were seeing so much value in it that then expanded to K-3, through, and we were doing the show me to the board of, okay, we're doing, these are the formative assessments we're doing, and here's what we're finding from them, and, and, you know, I think what, what you were hearing from, from Mr. Malone tonight was, and, you know, from um, Dr. Mears was, wow, this is really valuable. So now, as you see and, and hear from, from them that these are the things we've been retrieving and finding, let's now, rather than, you know, look at all of it, let's just take the ones that we think are really going to track the most information for us. You know, so rather than you look at screens upon screens of data, you know, what are the ones that are going to be the most valuable for you? So, and dashboards usually come from great big gigantic school districts that say, okay, we know the English 11 regents is going to tell us a lot about reading. And we know that watching that 3-3 in the LA and 3-3 math is going to be really, really important to us. So like they find certain ones. And for a lot of school districts that are high performing, tracking that SAT over longitudinal becomes really important. You know, that that's what's going to tell us how they're doing. And now ACTs are going, are really important. But we're small enough that we can look at things like the the formative assessments as well, which we don't grade children on. But that gives us really great plugins. You can you don't have to look at the child, but you can watch that that. You know, we used to follow the bouncing ball. You can follow that ball and see how those children are doing, and that really goes back to what the we used to like in the 2005 data was. We get to look at all the students, and like with Ames, Webb, and Pontus Pinnell, we can look at how children are doing in the county and the state and across, you know, sometimes across the country, um, at that same reading level. So th that's great because that, you know, I'm, I'm I'm running a race and I finished it in 40 minutes. Is that good or bad? Well, were you in a wheelchair or were you running against the most elite runners? That 40 minutes, well, I finished, it was a 5K I finished, or was it a 10K I finished? That, you have to put it in perspective. And so that's what the board wants. Want, the board wants to put it in perspective. So now pick the best thing and put it in perspective. You know, so that, um, I think that's what you want to do. Yeah, I think the other thing, though, is that what you're talking about I think we do, but we could do a better job of sharing what we look at with the board and the community. Um, yeah. Because I, I just jotted some notes down. I mean, what, what some of the things that we look at to measure or to keep track of how students are doing, obviously look at grades, we look at it by discipline, we look at it by teacher. Um, 
We also look at the assessment results, the summative assessment results, whether it's IDAP, the Regents, three through eight, even though they're less valuable because of the opt-out. Um, we look at college applications and college acceptances, the percentage of students who are applying to four-year schools, two-year schools. Um, we also look at retention rates. In other words, how, how often do kids go to school and then drop out? Um, we look at attendance and tardiness, which seems really mundane and boring, but it's actually important to look at because there's a direct correlation, whether we like it or not, between the percentage of classes that students attend and how well they do. Um, we also look at discipline records, again, by grade, by teacher, um, in terms of discipline referrals to see if there's a pattern. But all these things we could quantify on some type of general document for you if, that, if you found that helpful. But you should know that we do do that. And um, I'm, I think if you guys agree to open the sharing. I was going to say the same thing. I mean, the type of analysis and progress monitoring you describe is exactly what we do. I would argue we need to do doing more. Because yeah, so we're considering those that. data points yeah. in light of qualitative data and daily feedback that we get. I think the only hard part about sharing it is because we're a small school, we're going to be talking about certain children. So it's I under just 20, wanna, you can't talk so about it. So there's a yeah. lot of that going on that we can't share with you, but we can say what we do. So like for the social emotional support, we do a ton of progress monitoring there too, which we didn't even touch upon, and that also goes against goal two. Mm -hmm. But we can't talk about that. and. So there's a lot that, yes, we do, but it's not spoken about because we're taking care of, we're putting our kids first, which we should be doing. Absolutely. But, but the, the, some of the data you're talking about would be help inform the goal setting process. So you may know it, it will inform what you say, what, what, what you're saying we're going to cover, but it doesn't necessarily help the community or the board to necessarily know, hey, that makes a lot of sense, or why aren't we doing this, or whatever. Yeah, that makes sense to me. If I, if I could jump in as well. Um, so I think we have a very data-rich uh, uh, set, and looking at what we have access to, we could get overwhelmed with data. So I would also like to just add to what you're saying two things. One is we look at data oftentimes in a primary analysis. We don't usually do secondary analysis. Mm -hmm. That's one. Also, the utility of the data that we're using. So we want the biggest bang for the buck. And also, two, is it aligned with the priorities? So what are our priorities, and how do, you, how do we want to measure that? And then I'd also like folks to take a second just to think too, is to take a step back and ask ourselves, what are we saying by what data we're analyzing? Mm -hmm. um, and then that will help guide and reduce the number because it can be, we want to use your time well. So you want efficiency of the data, you want it quick, you want it timely, and you want it useful. So I think most, most of that we already have, it's just prioritizing what you want to look at and, and in what format. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that it's, it sounds, I mean, it seems like we're all talking about kind of the, these data-driven academic and wellness goals that we all think are real priorities for this year. And so given that we're going to be doing a bunch of workshops, it seems like maybe one of the first workshops should be just a discussion about which types of data we value the most as a community and that we want to dive deeper on and figure out kind of what where we want to go with that data. Um, I think we should open it up to the community to kind of come up or if you don't want to come up to the podium, stand up, whatever you'd like to do. If you want to tell us about the goals that you would like to see uh, the district consider or adopt or prioritize over the next year, that would be, that would be great. We'd love to hear from you. It, is it possible for us to see the goals that were handed out to everybody? Yes, there should be, were there extra copies right there at the corner? Are there any more? I thought that I thought there I left extra there. Did I? I yeah, we heard tonight are going to do some of the tasks that are swapped in on this, right? I think it's all left one time. I mean, we didn't. We don't have anyone writing from what they suggested. I'm assuming we're going to get an updated version. Of that's what they suggested. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why. No, it's not. It's on. Also put them up on the screen. I know it's hard to see. It's like a vision test. <laughs>
children. Um, Dax Stasek will be entering kindergarten um, in uh, September. I <laughs> um, And uh, so we're just, there's a couple parents here tonight who are wanting to um, speak about the vaccine issue on June 13th. The law was changed in New York State to repeal religious exemptions, which is affecting a certain population of your community here. And so wondering, is this a relevant moment to address our concerns to the board? and to the superintendent, or are we waiting until after the board officially adjourns? Certainly some of our concerns are something we would obviously want you to um, work towards this year. It is highly relevant given the law change. So if I could just sort of. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, if the majority of you here are here for that, as opposed to the goals meeting, then I would suggest we, yeah, we yeah. take a break and, and maybe yeah. just kind of make it. Are the parents amenable who are here Does, for that? Can I get a show of hands if you're here to talk about goals versus vaccines? So vaccines? Okay, and goals? <laughs> and another different public input meeting for the business agenda? No? Okay, so then. I think we should do that. Yeah. So I guess then um, are our two goals people good way giving it a way for all because we have some young yes. family members here. Thank you, you remember when you had kids at home? Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good? Yeah. Okay. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So I guess I think you're gonna start us off. You wanna well, I mean, and since I'm standing, I will, but I know that um, uh, I have some parents who are a little bit more prepared yeah. than I am. I was at soccer with my yeah. son and so decided to show up in solidarity. Before you start, why don't we just formally then open up the business meeting and have public input and read the yeah, instructions regarding public Certainly. input and everything? Um, and then we can go back to the goals. And then yes. we can go back to the goals, but that way anyone who did not want to stay. Um, there was some discussion about what which order we should have this in, and I remember last year tons of people showing up for the goals, so I thought <laughs> it would be a better use of time, but clearly I was wrong. Um, so I apologize for people that have not been here for the goals. Any more motion? Uh, can I get a motion to open the meeting? So moved. Second. Let's log in. Do the handle. Well. Yeah. I want to read the uh, public input yeah, stuff that's on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true. It was a pop a, a pop up trying to get me registered for a conference <laughs> for a dog. Okay. Got New York. I mean, <clears throat> yes, that's your name. All right, can we all stand for the pledge of allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Public input, and we'll let's hear from anybody that wanted to have any kind of public input in the um, business meeting. Um, in case, just not not only the vaccination related issue. Um, so there are some guidelines for public input. Um, they're normally posted up here, but um, basically, I don't know that I need to read through everything. But it's every person. Um, please state your name, and you have look into the camera and it's all being recorded, or look into us, but just know that it's being recorded, and you have um, three minutes, and don't uh, mention any specific person by name. Thank you. I'll go first, but the, I, I believe that most of the parents here are here for the same reason that I am. My name is Alex <coughs> Coulter. 
Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Superintendent Grace. Thank you, Board. I appreciate it. I'm the father of two boys here, Hopto and Leary, who I promised I will not make them talk. So. <laughs> Pearson has been very good to them, though. They have progressed beautifully. They have matured. They have carved out a vibrant social life. They have participated in sports in all three seasons. They love Pearson. The idea of not returning in the fall because of the repeal of the decades-old religious exemption is painful for them. With regards to this law, the New York State Assembly's recent repeal of the religious exemption, I am formally asking Superintendent Graves to write a letter to the regents, as well as to the judge charged with the legal case against the repeal, urging them to delay execution of the new law in order to give the 25,000 plus students in New York with religious exemptions and their families time to find suitable means to properly educate their children. California and Maine, two states that recently passed similarly misguided legislation, at least had the decency to allow families a minimum of two years to comply, find homeschooling options, or leave the state. New York will effectively grant 14 days from the first day of school. I have a half dozen examples of letters that other superintendents and principals have written in the state of New York urging a stay on the execution of this law. This is only a sample. There are many more. I will be happy to give anyone copies. I have, I have photocopied them. These are great letters, powerful expressions of plain common sense written by brave, articulate, intelligent people. I urge you, Superintendent Graves, to join the ranks of these American heroes and draft a similar letter. To allow New York to become a state hostile to religious individuals and their freedoms without lifting a finger would be a grave mistake. And one more humble request. This letter must be written tomorrow, Tuesday, August 13th, the day of the deadline, since the preliminary injunction hearing on the court cases is in Albany on Wednesday, August 14th. I would love to read all these letters, but I cannot. So I will read you just some very short examples. One, Headmaster Alexander Aver in the Faith Christian Academy in Poughkeepsie. To allow a law to go into effect just a few weeks before schools throughout the state begin a new school year offers parents no alternative except to pull their children out of school and thrust them into the outrageous choice between their religious convictions and attendance in school. Two, Superintendent Jalma, Smithtown Christian School. New York State has become a place that is hostile to religious individuals and their freedoms. Instead of the land of the free, home of the brave, our state is the land of the oppressed, home of the lobbyists. The individual stories of our families whose lives are thrown into disarray are heartbreaking, even though not a single one of them has ever posed a health risk to our school population. Our children will no longer be able to receive any services from the religious community which they called home. All over the state, the horrible individual situations are multiplied by the tens of thousands. Students on the cusp of finishing their academic careers now graduating from nowhere. Jobs and incomes lost as one parent must now stay home to educate their children the best they can despite little or no training and families with young children leaving the state. Uh, I'll read one more, Superintendent John Dolan, uh, East Islip School District. In my 34-year career, the religious exemption has never caused one issue or one problem. As an educator, as a parent, and a member of the human race, I implore you to grant a stay so that we can work together for a solution to this situation. There are many more, but, and I urge you to read them, and I have 10 packets here if anyone would like to. In closing, this is a capricious, vindictive, and unconstitutional law, a law which effectively criminalizes a formerly innocent segment of the population based on religious beliefs. I couldn't help noticing right here in the handout, it says, religious or other forms of prejudice will not be tolerated. And this is exactly the point of what, why I would like you to write a letter, Superintendent Graves. This is, this, this is religious persecution of the first order as well as an affront to the Nuremberg Code, which has as its first article, no forced medical procedures. Anyone who is at all religious, as I am, should be shocked by the direct affront to constitutionally guaranteed freedom of religion. It is the very first amendment in our Constitution. Congress shall pass no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. Religious is, is an important part of my life. I am the warden of my church, St. Anne's in Brichampton. I and my two boys are baptized into the Orthodox Church, the Orthodox Church believes our bodies are God-given and inviolate. Anything we inject into our bodies should remain our choice. Here is what the patriarch of the Orthodox Church has to say about mandatory vaccination. Parents should retain the right to make informed decisions regarding the health of their children. Persecution of parents for the use of this right is unacceptable. The right of children to education, including the possibility of studying in educational institutions, should not be limited because their parents refuse to carry out vaccinations for them. I will leave you, I would like to say one last thing, which is, by the way, the, uh, 
the, um, the, the Representative Dinowitz, who was a vocal proponent of this repeal, has mentioned that after next year in the legislative session, he will propose that all teachers, all personnel, all administrators, all administrators in all the schools in New York will have to be up to date on all their vaccinations going forward. And this will include Gardasil, which is now in the pipeline to be mandatory, the, the yearly flu vaccine, which is in the pipeline, as well as the 250 plus vaccines which are in the pipeline, the gold standard of which will be to make them mandatory. So if you love mandatory vaccination, this is a great time to be alive. What I would like to finish with is uh, the words of Thomas Jefferson. If people let the government decide what foods they eat and medicines they take, their bodies will soon be in as sorry a state as those who live under tyranny. Superintendent Graves, will you join the likes of John Dolan, superintendent of schools in East Islip, and write a letter in support of the delay of the religious sanction repeal? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank My name is Gail Becky. Um, public speaking is not my strong suit, and I do not have anything written out and prepared. But um, my oldest son graduated from Pearson just this past summer. His entire school career has been in this district. He is currently thriving at basic training in Georgia. And part of that, I think, is from his experience in this district, from having his hand held, walked down the hallway in kindergarten, all the way up to like those typical teenage boy things that we had to work through. Um, and the reason I'm sharing that is because I hear you talking about all of these wonderful, amazing things that you're working so hard to provide for our children in this community. And I've seen it in action. I've received so many emails, and I've watched my child thrive and be a healthy, vibrant individual who was a member of the fire department, and he was on the baseball team, and he really did well here. And now, <clears throat> I've got two younger children who have literally had all of these things that they should have access to ripped out from in front of them in a matter of eight hours. Eight hours this bill went through the assembly, through the Senate, and was off of Dov Governor Cuomo's desk signed. This has put our family in a position that I don't even really know how to express to you. Emotionally, because now we're being forced to choose between our deeply held religious convictions and public education. Financially, because now we have to figure out what, what, how do we do this? We're a local family, my husband is a, a carpenter. We both need to be working. And so, there are a lot of things that we're still trying to figure out. And I know this is like an extremely political and emotional topic, and I'm not asking anyone to say that they are opposed to vaccinations or not opposed, but this isn't even about vaccines. This is about our medical and religious freedoms, and we need our community support because it is vital to our children to have access to all things that you provide. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I implore you to please, please write this letter. Please support our children. We need you. We really do. Thank you. So I'm Michelle Leo. Um, as, as I said before, um, my son is Dax Dasik and my daughter is Aurora Dasik. Um, <laughs> they're coming for you. So I was homeschooled. Um, I'm born and raised in Sag Harbor. And uh, I was homeschooled from 6th through 12th grade for religious reasons. 
um, and I had a very interesting and very challenging experience with that. Um, so here I am faced in this profoundly ironic moment in my life as I was discussing with Mr. Malone recently on the phone trying to navigate the decisions for my own family and what to do for my children. I homeschooled. I did it. I know what that's like. And I did it in this district. Um, and I want my kids to go to public school. And my husband, because we are as local as <laughs> locals get, um, is a graduate of Pearson. And um, I want my kids to go here. And um, so does my husband. He feels really profoundly convicted. So we actually have an internal struggle as well. Um, and mine is no different than everyone else's here, the parents who are represented and the parents who are not, because board of ed meetings are dinner and bath time. And that's totally understandable, but challenging for us to show up in force. You know, I did what it mattered, Stella Maris, I was there, and I so <laughs> voted against that turf. Um, but my point is this, is, this is about religious freedoms, and we actually just stood in Pledge of Allegiance to the flag and talked about one nation under God, and so one of the things that's being challenged in this moment is that, and what your definition of is, and what your interpretation of, and what you feel about our religious expression. And we are not bringing our contagious and ill children into the school. If we were, they'd be being sent home by the school nurse after she put the thermometer to their forehead. I also happen to be a nurse, for those of you who don't know. So my choices are um, well thought out, in my opinion. I will stand by them. And my religious expression is not really to be questioned because I live in the United States of America. And so I implore you to consider all of that, whatever your opinions are on vaccinations and how you feel about children in the public or adults in the public, because mind you, all of us could get titers and it could be questionable on, on where we are. But we need our children to have the freedom. I didn't actually have the freedom as a child to come to public school, and I desperately wanted to. And now I am in a position as a parent to make a decision for my children based on what I think is best for him. And that's a really weighted decision for parents, but it's also impacting the kids. My children are really young, so they're not there. But I homeschooled at the age of some of the kids who are represented here and navigated what that was like. And so if for nothing else, for no other reason, support us parents, please, as we try to give our children the best education. We want them here. And if you can help us navigate what New York State imposed upon us, as Gail pointed out, in a mere eight hours, it was thrust in to law without thought for what the children would do going forward for the seniors who are about to step in to their next level of education. This is a huge deal. Social implications, emotional implications, educational implications, what their college, et cetera. This is no small thing. And this is, we, we share the responsibility with you. So I thank you for the time. I appreciate you all hearing us. And again, please consider our request. So I hate speaking to people in what they want. Um, Grace Gronsky, I'm going into my senior year and... You're doing great so far. <laughs> you got Grace Gronsky. I just want to get out of school, but I can't go into school and I hate school so much, but I just want to go for my last year and finish it with the only people that I know. Any idea how I'm coming? I want to do all the fun <laughs> things because I don't, I don't care about, like, I, I want to learn. I do want to do my last year, but I don't do, like, crazy IB stuff and all of that. But I just want to be in the last year. And it's weird to talk about this because I never did because I had to hide it, sort of, because it's a very judgmental thing. And I hate just having to say this like crying and I just want to just want to finish my last year of school because it's senior year and I've been waiting this is the only year I've wanted to actually be a part of and now I can't
My name is Alexandra McLaughlin. Um, I'm a homeowner, resident, Sac Harbor. I've lived here my entire life. Um, I have two small children that I came in with who are patiently waiting for me somewhere outside. This law has impacted my family, all of these families. Just so tremendously. There's no way to feel the impact of these things until you have it happen to you. When something is taken away from you that you perhaps take for granted or didn't think that you would ever question. Um, by a series of miracles, I was able to buy a house in this town where I grew up five years ago, before I had children, before I was married, with the intention of buying a house specifically in this town if I ever had children that they would go to Sac Harbor School. My daughter just turned one, my son is three. This is not something that I am immediately being affected by in the sense that they are being kicked out of school, but I am faced with the next 17 years of homeschooling two children. Financially, this is the most devastating thing that I can think, think of. I want to stay positive, hope for change, hope for better everything, but um, it's tremendous. It's, it's created a summer of gloom in our family. Um, I, you know, I, I too am just a local family. My husband is working two jobs so that I'm home with small children and I was looking forward to them eventually being in school, whether that's three, five years from now, that that would happen and I can go back to work and we can stay in the town that I grew up in as it increasingly gets more expensive. Um, we're asking for a letter. We're not asking you to say that you have our beliefs, that you share them, that you, um, n nothing of a personal opinion other than you support children continuing their education, and that this perhaps, at best, will create a pause in this going to effect. This is not necessarily gonna erase the law. And um, we really need the support. There are so many families being affected by this, so many in this small community, so many children that have not even got to school yet, so I don't even know the numbers, but these kids that are ready for a senior, 10th grade, 11th grade, they're so important, and finishing their education is so important. And I just, I beg you, please write this letter, please write it tomorrow or tonight, send it. I, I, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for hearing all of us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. My name is Jessica Bellaplato. I don't have anything prepared, and I thank the rest of you for all of your beautiful, eloquent words. Um, my ex-husband, Michael Nolan, was born and raised on Division Street, Love Lane, and then Division Street in Sag Harbor. He went to Stella Maris and uh, M.N. Pearson. I have a son, Jack Nolan, who just graduated the IB program, and a daughter, Uma, who is not so happy to be here, um, entering into high school. Uh, and desperately wants to come back to school in September. So I'm just imploring you to write the letter and thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna go to the I do that. <laughs> sending her off to kindergarten, she was going to be a hard ass. <laughs> and um, I have five children. My oldest is 28, my youngest is 14, none of whom have been immunized, all of who are extremely healthy. Um, I have a very hard time with all of this that's going on. I go to a very angry place and I don't want to do that. And if the letter could be written even by Jeff Nichols, because I know how creative we can get sometimes, Jeff, when we need to get our needs met. 
I would appreciate that very much. Um, I don't know who I'm addressing here, the board or you guys or everybody, but um, it's our children's rights to get educated regardless of what choices their parents have made. Um, and I believe that they will be able to go to school and finish their education without any, any problem. I did not realize my daughter felt that she had to hide this for all these years until she just spoke now. And um, I'm very proud of her to be able to come up here and talk to everyone. She started to tell me that she has told her friends and the friends all thought they would get sick from her because she was not vaccinated. And we clearly explained to them, you're vaccinated, you're protected. <laughs> She's not gonna get, she would get sick, not you. And they didn't even understand it. So to keep the secrets is just really, it's, it's painful for them. So I appreciate anything and everything and the opportunity to be able to speak on behalf of us mothers who do things differently and, and creatively. And daughters, and fathers, <laughs> all of the above. But parents, parents. Uh, thank you. Is there anyone By the else? way, I forgot to leave these. These are copies of the letters that other superintendents and principals have, have written. If anyone would like to take a look, please know I have. There are 10, 10 packets there. They're just samples from public, private, and um, charter schools, just so you get the, the breadth of how many people are involved in this. And Alex, I did everything that uh, you shared with me, I forwarded to the board last week. So Thank you. They, they've seen all the letters and, and Well, there are three more, but that's great. Thank you very much. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Is there anyone else here for public input? One. Well, thank you all for coming forward and, and speaking. Hi, my name is Bobby Cohen. I live in Sag Harbor. Um, change of pace is not um, This is about the goals um, and also just about something that took place earlier at this meeting. Um, one, well, as, as the uh, Diversity and Inclusion Committee spoke to you at the last meeting, we, our recommendation to you was that matters of diversity and inclusion became the lens through which you made all of your decisions this coming school year with the thought that that would continue on but but this year in particular when you're looking for a superintendent when we're looking for a superintendent that we look for someone who him or herself is not necessarily from a minority group but who has a lot of experience and a lot of commitment and dedication to dealing with those issues. Um, also, it was meant, the idea was mentioned of that the continuing to support our committee is no longer a task. I, I think perhaps that task could be rewritten, but I think it's absolutely still a task. Um, and I'd be happy to talk about it in a, at another time, but I just want to say that. <laughs> and the other thing that, that took place earlier in, in the meeting, um, uh, the issue of um, offering an, enough courses to uh, students and how the trade-off, you know, what do we let go because of something that, you know, something new that we want to include because we want to be um, responsible to the taxpayers. I totally understand that, and I don't really know the details of what happened, but when my son, I don't even remember how many years ago he graduated from Pearson, but when he, in his uh, junior and senior year, he and several other students had um, access to a filmmaker, and I don't, I think it was, um, it was something that they had expressed an interest in, the district made it happen. My son, with his um, fiance, formed a uh, uh, production company. Another one of the students is a filmmaker. My son has produced work for, for Comedy Central and for New York Times. There's another student who's out in California doing 
in that field, and it's because Pearson made something available to them. And then there are other details from my older daughter, so that requires more of a memory on my part, which is non-existent, but <laughs> I know that she was able to develop something that she, she went to, uh, probably a guidance counselor, and said, this is what I really want to pursue, and they made it happen. And I'm thinking that there perhaps are creative ways for us to come up with something that does not require a huge amount of, of um, financial resources because perhaps you put the onus on the student, him or herself, to research what can be done. I don't know, but I just want to suggest that we can make things happen for students because you've done it before for two of my kids, and that's it. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else here that wants to speak at public input? And if not, we can, I guess, uh, adjourn from the business meeting temporarily and go back into the goals meeting. So I guess we're going to have, uh, before you guys before leave, you guys leave um, gonna, I've asked the board to have public discussion about the letter. So I don't know if they just. You guys, do you want to walk yeah. home? Well, <laughs> 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 huh, so I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. What? <laughs> so what's, what's on your mind? Well, um, our, um, our government in New York State um, gets strong ideas, um, and I'm going to give you the example of the Common Core um, implementation. It was a really great idea brought brought forward by 30 governors in, in, across the country. That country, states that were contiguous, like New York State, Connecticut, and New Jersey, um, Nevada, California, um, Oregon, and Washington. So all these contiguous states had people moving back and forth. So let's teach the same thing at the same grade level. That hit the federal government. The federal government went out to states and said, we'll give you a lot of money if you will implement that. So the, our commissioner at the time, Commissioner King, said, do it in two years and this money will be available. We'll just make it happen. Build an airplane in the air. So we had the fastest implementation in New York State, almost any other state in the Union of the Common Core, and put it right into the state tests the same year. Common Core is a great idea and had, was really vetted out and thought out universally across, across the country. But the implementation was so fast that it created so much stress and so much anxiety that if you say common core, it's like a dirty word now. All the good was missed in the thoughtfulness of it. Um, I think that um, the implementation of this is so rapid. Parents are having to get the children fully um, from the letter we got in June, all their immunizations, some of these for high school students in one summer. Um, so for people are having to go from no immunizations on a single child to think about the immunizations you started with your children when they were two and three months old to all the immunizations you took them through through junior high, measles, mumps, and rotavella right up through, you know, um, uh, meningitis shots. That's a lot. That's a lot. Um, so I think the letters that most of this, my fellow superintendents are writing was, wow, really poor implementation. So anything that's going to be implemented needs to be implemented in a procedural, thoughtful manner with parents in mind. So for example, if parents really, really want to hold on to this, give them the opportunity to apply to schools outside of New York State. Give them the opportunity to figure out how to stay home and homeschool their children. It's hard to do that between June and August. Um, so that's most of the letters that I was reading are, are about that. It's the implementation. Um, so wh wherever you fall on immunizations, um, New York State's implementation, I have, I have to, and everybody <coughs> does, that. we have to uphold the laws of New York State. No doubt about it. We have to uphold the laws of New York State or we all get fired. So. That's where we stand. We don't get to change the laws, but we can write a letter saying your implementation of this 
doesn't isn't good for, for families or children. So that's where I kind of come down on this. So you're suggesting that it would make sense to write a letter? Um, sometimes they have to hear about how this impacts families. And in California and other states, from the, the information that was sent was so incredibly helpful, thank you, that they, they're looking at like a two year, it sounds like a stay of execution, so during the, they have two years yes. to at least examine it and to not only look at other alternatives, but to, what I was shocked about it too is, do they even know how a child's body will respond to all of those immunizations that they would have to get. And by the way, out here, it takes you a month or two to get into your pediatrician anyway. But that concerned me because it didn't seem like it, would, it could potentially be physically dangerous for children to get all those immunizations in a short period of time. Regardless of whether you believe in immunizations or not, there doesn't seem to be science behind that implementation rollout. Um, so I'm supportive of the letters reflecting that there be a uh, kind of a grace period and I'm not going to say whether I believe in immunizations or not, or my political position on it, but the way that they're implementing it in New York State seems unsafe for children and unfair for families, just not giving them the appropriate time to at least reflect and make whatever decisions they need to make. So I, I think this needs to be fair. Whatever they do needs to be fair. And I don't think what they're asking these families to do, or districts to do, frankly, is fair. So I would support writing the letter. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to I feel the same way. I mean, outside the deadline that it was for September that everybody had to be immunized. I think so if they were to start the process. If they no. Were, no, you can't show up to school prepared. until you have all yes. your immunizations. I mean, there was a, if you were enrolled, I think during the yeah. summer you, there was a different deadline, but it was much earlier. So I, I think it's a lot, but you know we're not going to examine here whether it's the right thing or not. But I I feel very positive about writing. Well, we're sort of over a barrel because we we took that oath that we have to uphold the laws in New York State, but I think they have to hear from the people that have to support those laws. And I, I have to have the will of the board on, on that letter. So I'm um, needing to hear from all of you. Te just a technical question since we're mi missing two board members. Obviously, the will of the board is not a formal vote. Do we, what do, I, we, what do you I need actually, from I, I actually yes. do have to have I think I have to have a vote because I, if I'm writing the letter, I have to have a vote. I have to have, I have, to have the majority of the board support me in, to, in, on the action. So four out of the five present will be uh, will be needed yeah. to move forward. Yeah, that's why. I'm, yeah, that's why I'm bringing it to you. Um, if you guys, do you, I, I'm happy to speak last, or if you don't. Think about it. I am incredibly moved by what all of you have to say, and as. A Jewish person who had relatives in the Holocaust, religious freedoms are in, like so important. Exactly. I'm also the daughter of lots of doctors, so from the kind of I, it, I'm I'm struggling, um, and you guys have just presented a point of view that I hadn't really considered before, um, and it's very moving. Um, but it's one side of it, so I can't say right now. Like, I want to do my own research first and see what is the Anti-Defamation League saying about this. That's what I, that's kind of the first thing that came to my mind. Um, you know, there was a bunch of letters referenced. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to read the ones that were, that were sent, but the, you know, the ones that referenced are, only one out of the four were from public schools. Um, so it's just coming from a different standpoint. So I, I would want to do more research. I'm happy to, to do that more research by tomorrow before I give you the, the, my will, but I'm not prepared to to support it just yet. I, mm -hmm. I need just a little more time to do research. I'm going to agree with you. I thought it was my understanding that um, well, definitely Cuomo moved it through very quickly. Um, how, how will a, a, a letter written um, we, you, pe the people that spoke feel that a letter written Will, what do you feel it will do? Like, from from what I, I mean, they can answer. From, I mean, I from my, my, my my impression is that the letters that I read, because I, I didn't read all of them, but I read maybe five or six, the first five or six that were sent, and I also read the data sheet he provided and everything else. That the letters from districts were in saying you should overturn everything in this law. What it was saying is you should give two years 
like other states have who are mm -hmm. implementing the same philosophical change. So California is requiring immunization for public schools, but they're saying you have there'll be two years for families to be able to address this, and it will be two years before schools will have to implement it. So it's so the letter is not saying whether you're for immunization or against it. It's Correct. the letter is saying there should be a two-year grace period. Was that what our letter is saying? What, well, that's what we asked for. That, right. that, I that, that. Or or just uh, just to stay, just to stay on the law. Like what uh, I think I slipped if I'm um, that superintendent said, let's just stay starting. Let, let's let the kids in school and let's keep talking about this. But if, if we agree to a letter. What's the content of it, in a sense? That's more what would you suggest? My right. suggestion is um, let's let the children start school and let's keep this conversation going. You know, I don't think we're going to get to two year, but I think the conversation has to keep going. That was that was pretty that was pretty um, you know, I, I don't th I think we're talking about a handful of families, but um, I think that when you get across the state, we're talking about a lot of families um, that have very little voice. Um, and what the consequences are left with is moving out of state or homeschooling. And I mean, is the letter asking for a stay or a staged implementation? What I mean, maybe we can hear some from of the letters letter talked about two years. That's what we're thinking. asking for. Right. You come back up. No. I would prefer it to be a stay. It should be a stay. It's going through both. Uh, it's going there are two cases right now. There's one important case of uh, um, presided over by Judge Hartman. And that is about um, that is really about the legality of the law, um, and 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 the judge has the option to to order stay, and it can be rolled out much slower. Same with the, that's why we also want a letter to the Board of Regents. The Board of Regents has power to over the implementation of the law, how quickly it is. They do have the the, the ability to really slow it down and allow people like us to get our lives together and figure out exactly what our next step is. So yes, a stay is the answer. If you read the other letters, they spelled it out pretty, pretty uh, clear. I read the first seven that you sent, and I didn't get a chance yes. to read. Them. Yes, they're right there, and 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 you you'll get an idea. They're they're quite similar, though they're all very good in their own right. But I, I urge you to read them because that's pretty much the letter that I think we're looking for. Do any of you have a a sense? And this is not definitive of my opinion at all. I'm just curious as to, the, and ha, have the ACLU or ADL taken a stance on this at all? The, the anti, I was just reading the, the ADL has taken a stance in April when this first popped up, that they were concerned that uh, certain religious groups were being labeled as responsible uh, for the outbreaks. So that was their position. I, I haven't read anything beyond that since the end of April. I would imagine that many of you know that it was the New York measles outbreak that was really a propelling force behind this aggressive law that came into place. And that really led to having personal friends and colleagues um, who live up in Rockland County. That led to some serious and aggressive discrimination in the Orthodox Jewish community. There is also, um, for many of the Orthodox religious communities, it's related to vaccine ingredients, and so it goes against their religious beliefs for the, to inject their bodies with things that they are not able to ingest by their religious law. And so the stay that we're asking for is that. It's to pause this and stop continuing this rhetoric that is pinpointing and discriminating against different religious groups that are being sort of more at the forefront because New York, it was the Jewish measles outbreak. And that's not what happened, you know, but it, it, that is the way that it was painted because of how the disease spread and which community it spread in. But it is having a, a larger impact on multiple communities across the, the state. And, and obviously, um, some of the letters are more from the private schools and the charter schools because they're being more impacted. Many of the private schools in the area are literally discussing whether or not they're going to have enough students to be able to continue. That won't be the case for Sag Harbor. Your school's not shutting down because of the small group of students that are already in your school. But those kids, as you saw, the seniors who were speaking on their own behalf in a really strong way, 
they want to finish school here. And then again, for some of us parents who have younger children, my son was already in the pre-K, he's already been in school, and I've filed the appropriate paperwork and done my work as my mother did uh, when we were growing up. And I'm following through, and so we're not asking you to go against the law or break any of the rules you are bound by, but rather to utilize your force and the voices that you have to try and impact some of the higher ups in government to say, hold on a second, this is impacting our community, our children, because you are the educators of our children, but we are also like the holders, we're the parents, so we are not only the educators, but the guarder, you know, the guardians, they're complete guardians, and so we're asking you to work with us to help really just do the best for our children specifically. Maybe something we should talk about that here from Tom on. Well, I, I, I don't think we're, we have to, by law, uphold the law of New York State. I'm not asking, no, 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 I'm saying in terms of the letter. I understand okay. opening school day, you're following the law. We can't do anything about yeah. that. We're yeah. powerless to do anything about that. We have to. But uh, asking Tom whether we were allowed to legally? No, like, or what to put in the letter, what not to put in the letter, what implications that may have versus a phased approach, a stay, those are different. Those have different legal significance. That I, that I don't know. I don't know it. Was there a letter from the from the <coughs> uh, from superintendent of Riverhead? Riverhead, and there was one from my son. Okay. I thought it was someone from River, Riverhead can, Public School District. I think that the board can can agree that a letter come forth generically supporting the parents, and then I can wordsmith it out, and the board can agree on it. They can. So that's 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 as much as I can give you. Like I can't. I can't word Smith the word tonight, but you can, you can say based on the board's approval and the attorney's approval. I, mean, I don't think a letter says that the board is endorsing one position or another. It's I think it's saying it needs to slow down because I mean again I worry physically. It's the one being asked though. That's what my question is. Mm -hmm. Like being asked to slow it down or, or consider a different rollout is mm -hmm. different than asking for a stay. And if the board sent it a letter, that's the board's position. That, that's why I was asking for clarification on that. That's the only reason I was asking that. Well, I know that it's in the courts, so it, that would be. Right, until it changes. So all the letters that's my only they are saying, like, basically, what? Just, no, they're letters. So all these they, letters they, they're different. Some, they're different some, yeah. some reference I feel a two-year rollout, some are stay. It depends. Is there is a concern? People want to be like heard about this, and you know these are all people from the community, and I think that's what they're asking for. So not advocate for a stance, just say we we get community members. Um, you know, yeah, we we're concerned about this. There is very rapid, you know, implementation of this. So we can talk about the rapid implementation. Yeah, because you know, a lot of these families might decide to go a different route in a year. But right now they're putting them like you know in a strict deadline, which I know is going to be enforced because this is the state law. But at the same time, you know, people need to be heard. So we can do it from the perspective of the burden that's put upon the parents, rather than advocate for one way or the other, and let them see the problems. I can. I, well, I, I took notes on everybody. I, I think there should at least be a delay in the rollout. If, 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 if the board feels the stay is too far, and I'm not, I, I, I'm not advocating for that. I'm not sure what my personal position is on, on immunization, but I, I, I'd be hard pressed, pressed to hear a logic of how it is safe and fair to roll this out in six weeks or eight weeks. That it's fair and safe to give a 17 or 18 year old senior every immunization shot that's required by law from the time they're born in a six week period. And there's actually, I haven't, you know, from what I read, there's no research that even shows the impact of that on the child's health. To take had that many shots, that immunization in a six-week period. So can that even be done? It, it, well, that's what the state's requiring. Right. It, right. So that's what the state's requiring. So I think whether you are for or against immunization, I think you're hard pressed to say that's a fair and healthy thing to do to a child. And if if we all agree to that, then that's a common ground to say at least a delay in the rollout to give a certain period of time. Maybe, you know, the two years like what the law was in California, that we would at least hope that the state would do X, the two year, however it's worded, that's what I'm suggesting, because that might be a compromise from how everyone's feeling here,
to because that will at least give families the appropriate time to reflect on options and we'll also give if a parent decides to immunize their child they can do it in a way where they're not getting i mean how many shots that does was this, like, yeah, does, how many does shots does they require what, what they're referring to is it it's five is it 20. Age group. i'm sorry it's different for everybody but if you're 18 right does that end up being like 12. there's 12 shots yeah so there's and multiple are combination. So you're not talking about 12 viruses that you're being immunized against. Mm -hmm. You're talking about 12 injections that you're receiving. That can be up to four in one injection. What I don't understand is, from 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 what my the pediatrician of my children said was that there are some that you need to time with distance between them for them to even be effective, mm -hmm. and they're and they would have six weeks to get all of them. So again, I. It sounds like not everyone's on board with a stay, and I'm not arguing for a stay or, or against a stay, but perhaps the, the, the place that we could be at is reflecting what some of the other states have done in the implementation of a two-year, and we're asking for a reasonable period of time mm -hmm. for students to, and families to address this. That would be my suggestion. Can I add one more piece that hasn't really been discussed, and that is, um, you know, maybe not so much in this district, though I'm sure it is existent, are um, children that are affected that currently hold 504 pro pro um, plans and children that have IEPs, and also children that sometimes, like, their only meal is in school. You know, like, there are other populations that are going to be really, really affected by this in ways that like we haven't even really been able to figure out. So when you're talking about you don't know like the safety and the efficacy of doing however many vaccines at one sitting, then you're also talking about children that are already immune compromised and now they are being put in a position where not only are they immune compromised, but now they have to receive all of this in a time that is not conducive to their health. So that's like one other little piece to add in to this. And that's part of this like how everything is poorly implemented in that these families now are, are even stuck in a different way than a lot of us are stuck. Mm -hmm. Should I make a motion? Because I know that mm -hmm. on this or is there more discussion to be had? I mean, does, is it a vote or can we just like well, throw down and now? We're hearing Why that there needs to be a vote. I, um, I, I need the will of the board to write a letter. I'm saying if we email Jordana, because I'm sure Jordana wanted to think about it, I'm still thinking about it. We can hear from the other board members. I didn't know it was going to be on tonight. Right, so just, you know, you I just well, I just need Hold on. Do I? Can I just give you a recommendation? Mm -hmm. Like, do a motion be it resolved that the Board of Education gives the authority to the superintendent to write a letter to New York State. And you can change this around. This is just me playing around while you're talking. Uh, regarding immunization requirements and asking for a delay in the rollout or a stay. I would say a delay in the rollout. And you're giving up the authority to say stay. I would say a, a delay because I'm not hearing that, you know, a stay is a different position, but a delay, a, a delay, a two-year delay reflective of the laws in some of the other states or whatever it is. You I tell think. me how you want to write it, and you can make it general so that you can go to mm -hmm. Tom and write a letter. You do we, just, do we know that we need the vote of the board? Or like, should, is that something we should check with Tom with? I just, if the four of you are all for that resolution, then it's the will of the board, and that that's fine. I personally need more time. Um, but I'm how not do we saying, do that for tomorrow? Is so, right. because we, we're supposed to do this in yeah. public. Right. So how do we do that when it's? Well, I was going to say, I mean, if, if there are others that need more time, I'd be willing to try to convene a quorum at some point tomorrow, and in the interim, we could get Tom's thoughts on a form of letter that is something. I just, I'm, I'm not there yet. Okay, I'm going to put a motion on the table now, and if, if people don't want to support it, they don't have to. But I'm going to put a, a motion. I appreciate that, but I just, I mean, we we it's can't we, we can't get we can't get everyone from the board to show up for our annual goals meeting. So the idea that we're going to come together again tomorrow, I think, is unlikely. I'm going to put a motion on the floor, and I appreciate the thought, a motion on the floor that, that a letter is written from the superintendent to whatever government agencies it needs to go to, asking that the, that the law um, uh, not be implemented for two years um, to give appropriate time for families to address and uh, to address. I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, there are letters from other public school districts, like Why Riverhead. What? Why two years? Because uh, th that's what the other states that have done this 
have, have given, and that's what the letter, what public letters were, letters from the other public districts that I read, like Riverhead, said that. So it seems to be how some other public districts are responding. Um, so I'm sorry to interrupt. California passed a similar repeal and allowed three to eight years for students to get vaccinated. California also allowed students with IEPs and 504 plans to maintain their religious exemptions, by the way. And that's California. And New York State is granted 14 days, by the way, in comparison to three to eight years. So I think that I think the river heads me the letters I saw were two years. I'm just making a motion for that. Okay. I'm trying to find a compromise on the board so that we can get majority. So I, mean, if you want to I make a motion. I'll go second. Okay. But if you're making a, a motion and a second, I the wording is you're saying two years? Yes. Okay. Should we log in? Are you doing this on? Yes, and I'll read it again. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm okay with asking for the board, the superintendent writing a letter saying we think that the rollout should be revisited. Yes. It's not comfortable with two years. I don't think we should put a timeline on it. We should ask that it be considered and delayed, but we shouldn't put a timeline. Well, so we, I made a motion. We have to vote on that, and then if it fails, we can make another motion. Just procedurally, that's what we have to do. Okay, so your vote you seconded? Yeah. So this is um, asking for the law to be delayed in a rollout for two oh, years. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Two um, years. Chris, you're, you're shooting for a timeline just <coughs> to, um, or, or, or a specific time frame just? Well, because, uh, because I heard that. I'm not trying to help me understand. Yeah, the okay. reason why I put a timeline was because I heard from some stay, I heard from some they were uncomfortable with it, so I'm putting a timeline to create more comfort on the board to say that it's not open-ended, like, mm -hmm. because that seems to be taking more of a position on this versus a delay. It's not saying whether I support or don't support it, but I think that it's moving too quickly, so let's create a delay. Um, and mm -hmm. again, the, I think that's what the letter said from the superintendent from Riverhead, so there seems to be some other Neighboring districts were taking that position, so it seemed like it was a smart course of action. Okay, thank you. Does that make is a three to two vote, so it fails, and I'll read out. Um, I have Jordan and Brian opposed. I have Susan Schaefer, Chris Tice, and Yorgos Garcia. I'm sorry, can you say that louder? Can you start from the yes, beginning? Yes, it's going to be on, on the screen. Mm -hmm. <coughs> they all yeah. Yeah. So what else do you like hands? Right. I'll read it again. It's um, Jordan, Sobe, and Brian DeSessa opposed. Susan Schaefer, Chris Tice, and Yorgos various as yes. Did you want to make a different <coughs> I motion, motion or? I want to put a motion for that the superintendent send a letter to the appropriate entity indicating that there's concerns on how the fast implementation will affect our community and urging them to reconsider the timeline for rollout. Does anyone want to second that? Concerns with the fast implementation or reconsider a longer rollout? Or we can request a longer rollout? Right. We'll reconsider. 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 Longer rollout. So basically, the difference is we don't have a specific time frame. Mm -hmm. We're just going to get a little bit. Okay. So Brian made a motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. And I'll publicly say I'm going to support it, so at least we have something versus nothing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would have gone a bit stronger, but at least we'll have something. 
Okay, it's opening um, to vote. Wait, do we want to have any discussion? Go ahead. Is there any? <laughs> I'm in agreement that there should be something like that. So. I, I feel that we've heard from one side of the community tonight, and Correct. they've swayed me more on this than I've ever been swayed. So kudos to you all. Um, I just, I need to do, I can't get there until I do more research. I need to better understand exactly what the law is. I'm, I'm a lawyer, I need to read it. And I've now actually, like, before I really wasn't focused on the specifics, and you guys have made me focused on the specifics, but I, I need to actually take time and read it. I don't wanna be rushed into a decision on something that is so important for so many people. Um, so I'm not there yet, but if the four of you are, then. Well, we gotta vote. Yeah. Um, do I know, do we know how many students that can have? I'm not holding it to you, five, 10, I'm, I'm just. In this district? Yeah. In the school? In the school. Just curious. I think we're under 35, right? I believe so. Just a hypothetical. It's a rough question. number. Perfect. Perfect. 35. Out of the 400, whatever we have, five. Well, yeah. 900. In this case, if it's the case of 12. Based on the letters that we sent out, yeah. so the yeah. information we have. Yeah. 900 in the district. That yeah. actually go to the building. Mm -hmm. 950. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A little higher than most districts, Thank though. And it, it goes along with our home schooling. We have a unique, we have a unique community. All right, let's vote. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm closing the vote. We have four to one. Jordana opposed, Brian DeSessa, Susan Schaefer, Chris Tice, and Yorgos all yes. So motion passed. Thank you. To be clear, that in no way affects the law or how the school is going to implement that, nor does it, in my personal opinion, um, weigh in as to how I feel about that issue. But and Jordana, I respect you 100%. Yeah. Okay. So start school children have to be immunized. Correct. But so the letter will go out tomorrow. We will. Thank okay. You. Okay. The letter will go out tomorrow, and I'll make sure you're copy on it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Very much. It's great to hear from you. And and by the way, just I I am going to read up on it, and I if if I get to a place where I support you, I will. Wholeheartedly support you. I think the point of all of this is that we respect and appreciate everyone's stance, and we're just asking to implement our freedoms, to do exactly that. So thank you, all of you, for taking the time, and thank you for. Uh, so Michelle, thank you for never holding back on any of your opinions and all the time. I've been here for the next 17 oh, years, guys. <laughs> we only have thank a few you. more weeks left together, so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate yeah, how all of you are. Thank you. I would like to do this for help with your research. I will definitely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Board, the board heard some 
really great stuff from the administrators we spoke, but would love to hear from the community as to any priorities regarding goals or anything you wanted to share. So stand up or come to the podium, whatever you'd like. Um, I just wanted to talk about um, the diversity part. And Chris is alluded to the fact that we, should, we can now take that off because it's in production. And I want to disagree with that. I think we just became um, a committee. We have wellness, emotional wellness on there as part of the goals. Mm -hmm. Diversity and inclusion comes right into emotional wellness. Um, so if you're going to take out diversity and inclusion, then you need to take out emotional wellness because we have a wellness committee and we've been working on our, our wellness. And for me, that doesn't make sense. Wellness, diversity, they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And these, are, should be, these should be goals that stay on because we have to get to a point to measure those goals. And a diversity and inclusion is not at the stage where we can measure our successes yet. And it needs to stay there. Um, that's right. I, I, can I just clarify yeah, for a second? I'm, I, I, I probably wasn't clear before, so I apologize. I felt like saying that we support the Diversity and Inclusion Committee mm -hmm. wouldn't be the task. I think there should be other tasks around diversity and inclusion. It was just that now we're operating that committee, are there other inclusion and diversity tasks okay, that attached to uh, attached to what the school district does? Because the, the committee is going to continue, but what are, the, are there tasks besides the committee continuing around that? So if that makes sense. Yeah. So it wasn't so much about not supporting the category, it was the committee's going to keep going, but what are the tasks around diversity? Because ultimately, when you have a broad goal, the specific tasks around it are supposed to, um, the district goals are supposed to be high arching vision, visionary statements that set vision, and then the objectives or tasks under it are supposed to be measurable, definable, and measurable. So they're specific, they're not kind of generic. So that's why I was just saying there should be some tasks there that are. So we have um, continues to support the district-based committee, uh, committee for diversity and inclusion for the purposes of continuing to create a diverse and inclusive school community of culturally responsive practices. So maybe embedded in there is, you know, well, are defining. There things, are there things that the district is doing specifically right. supporting diversity and inclusion that we can say, Forming this or adding this right. program or something that's specific. Maybe um, just I think based on your presentation in July, you, I think the task that you guys actually is wanted was take diversity in, and inclusion into consideration in every big decision that the school makes. Right. And we also have you know a couple of tasks in there. You but know, I think that's kind of a task. The teacher training, stuff. all that stuff yes, is in there. Is. So maybe instead of continue to support the district-based committee for diversity and inclusion, maybe it's think about way, or not, not think about, but let's make it more task, like maybe we can word it in a way that says take, take implement. Yeah, implement diversity and inclusive decision making throughout mm -hmm. major district decisions and, right. and continue to get district-wide education and professional de development. I mean, those I think would be two great tasks, but. I'm gonna throw out something that's specific as an example, because I, um, and, I'm, and, I, and I'm so glad we have people championing this, because it's so critically important. The, um, and I'm just doing this as an example, I'm not suggesting it be a task or not, but we don't have a, we, we have very limited diversity in our staff. We have some, but it's, it's limited. And so a task could be, and I'm not suggesting it is, but here's an example of that we will examine and implement new methods to, to um, work harder to increase the diversity in our staff. Some districts do that. So they use additional websites or services to increase their pool of candidates for their jobs to make sure that it is the most diverse um, qualified pool that they can have. So I'm just using that as an example of a specific thing that might help achieve with the, with the Goals. And that was on um, our presentation in July. Right. Correct. So and that, I think, also in our um, conference coming up this week, that's probably one of the subjects we will. It was one that, that I, uh, an ISPA conference I went to, talked about that being a goal in a lot of districts now. But I, I do think, think that also speaks to the idea of always keeping diversity and inclusion in mind when big decisions, for decision. example, like hiring practices. Um, you know, that's that's present and in the forefront when making those decisions. 
Yeah, so may, maybe the task is formalized way to implement diversity, inclusion in those decisions, but we don't have to kind of talk about what those are yet. We still need to figure out what those are. So in, in large decision making. Or district wide decision making. Restrictive building wide. Okay. Not that one. Is there anyone else that wants to share their goals? Hi, this is Lola Kane. Nice to see you all. Um, I appreciated the change in format of kind of getting right into it in terms of goals, so just wanted to thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to go back to what the conversation earlier in terms of data, and I so appreciate um, all the different sort of hard data that you look at in terms of graduation rates and tests and what have you, but one of the things I was hoping that, actually the last couple of years I was hoping that the district would consider is um, a, a more systematic way to look at the soft data, the qualitative data. So, in other words, it's not just like what the tardies look like or what the um, test scores look like, but how are kids feeling about school? Do they feel inspired by their teachers and their classes? And do they, are they happy to be coming here? And I, during that time of the board, I saw that a number of other school districts around the country do survey their kids every year. And some even survey their kids and their teachers about you know what they think and whatever, and I hear that actually that data ends up being really valuable. Um, and sometimes families look at that and say, "Yep, we knew about so and so or so and so or what have you." But I would just love to see because one of the things that I am missing hearing when I hear some of the kids talk, and obviously, look, so many kids are having a fabulous experience here, but sometimes I'm not hearing them feel so inspired. So it would be great if we could survey so we could I find out the ways that we can do that more and better. So that was just the only thing. So I just want to put a plug in for a student survey, maybe the student and teacher survey. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think that, that goes right into kind of what we were talking about, about having maybe a workshop at some point, talking about what are the data points that we want to to measure and what are we prioritizing and kind of, kind of having that be an evolving discussion to then formalize over the course of the year. Mm -hmm. I think that goes back to what Dr. Muir said about, you know, what a district measures tells a lot about a district. Um, and it can, you know, I have really dear friends that are, that are superintendents at some of the highest performing districts and when I see them, they're like, we want to work, we, we envy the things that you have at South mm -hmm. Harbor because of the, not only the athletics and but they said, you have kids that want to be in the musical. And we have kids that go, we can't try out for the musical because we have to go to SAT practice every night. And then we have to do this. And the only reason that they're in orchestra is not because of their love of music, but it, their parents are like, you have to do that. And we don't have have to's in our district. We have want to's. We have a lot of want to's in our district. So what gets measured is what gets done. So what Susan was bringing up is you find out if you're measuring what they love, that's that's a really important feedback to get, a data point to get back on. And our kids love an awful lot about this district. And then you find out maybe there's where the you know we're we're not strong. You can always get better. Anyone else want to weigh in on some goals? So. Where do we go from here with these goals? I don't, I mean, from what I'm hearing, it doesn't sound like there are any major, huge topics that anyone wants to add. Um, we could go through each of the goals and kind of summarize some of the tasks that we want to do, or we could ask Katie to, based on the conversations that yeah, have had, to draft something, and then, yeah. I'm, I'm willing to take the data points from all the administrators and embed those yes. in there if you're willing to kind of with them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's really helpful because they brought up some really specific mm -hmm. tasks that are going to be at the meat of what this looks like this year. That's the stuff that's measurable, that's the stuff where you know the kind of the feet on the ground. So if it can be if it can be put together, I would suggest it would be emailed to the board so we have a chance to kind of mm -hmm. review and respond. So at the next meeting they could be um, discussed one more time publicly, and maybe a draft can be posted so the public can see it and can weigh in a second time. Sure. 
and then they can be um, adopted so that we can start the school year hopefully with adaptive goals. Since we started late this summer, it'd be nice to it not be October and we still have a milestone. Sure. That'd be my suggestion. I agree with that. It's a motion, I'll second that. Okay. I just want more time. We're not in a Because I know with that space, right. you know, in academics <laughs> and all these calls and everything, I think we had a discussion, should we add anything around business call goals for the district? You know, the financial health or like the reserves so or something like that. Well, I think what might be important is have um, so to have a, a workshop on on what we do like what we do have like we have a wonderful five year plan that definitely needs to be updated, mm -hmm. but um, uh, and it's kind of in two parts. We follow the New York State um, piece on that, but then we have like the Moody Bond rating piece on that, which if you're familiar with that is is where we are and, and how we got there. So we really, and I think our community could use that too, and if we can do that before I leave, so that you, you like anybody who's applying for the job could watch that. They do a whole heck of a lot more, um, but that might be worth a, a workshop. So again, so you know where you're headed, you know, so what you have, what you don't have, and what you need to have, you know, um, so, because a lot of that information is there, um, especially while we, for a short time, have Jennifer Buscemi working as an accountant on special projects. We could <coughs> probably make that a special project for her to put those pieces together, and that would be a goal mine for a new person coming in to have that, and for the board to have that, right? So you know where to build upon. Um, because you're in good shape, but that could unravel in one to two years, right? Yeah. And, you don't, and you don't ever want that to happen. Yeah, I also, um, oh, we have a question from the audience. Oh, sure. Hi, sorry, I, I should have spoken up when you gave me the opportunity before. So I, I don't it's mean to be a dead horse, but I'm going to. Just, um, I mean, I, I felt very supported in July when we when we presented our, our um, through and the Diversity and Inclusion Committee presented our, um, our accomplishments and Pleasure. our recommendation to you. But and, um, right now, as it is, and I think you are revisiting it, but as now as being like a one-sixth of part two um, in, in terms of diversity and inclusion, it does not feel like a strong enough statement to me, and so I'm just hoping that whatever you come up with reflects sure. the importance yeah. of it. So the, the revision is gonna be all-encompassing, okay. as Ms. Renosho said, so that every major decision. No, I I, I understand so that, but that's not on here, and I and I I got the feeling just, from you that you support just, that. Just I'm replace. just I'm just being a dead horse, and I'll yeah. shut up next. We no, no, we did that, and then we're going to revise the show. I agree. Here's what I wrote: diversity and inclusion. Keep in mind with all with all decision makings for district and for all decision making that making at the district and building wide. So when the revised draft comes out, it's not on this one. I agree with you. I, but, but I understand on the that's, revision, a, it'll be that's like a vision statement. That's not a task. A task is something that you can define process and is measurable. Correct. So we could have that on here, but then how do we know if we really did it or not? So I, so, I, so hold on. So my, pardon me one second. So my suggestion is because I thought in the presentation you had they were very concrete things yeah. that were meaningful. So I would suggest that perhaps. You can look at that list, whoever whoever the they would be or the person would be, and maybe say, okay, these are the ones that I suggest, and those could be some of the tasks in this section. So that there's there's concrete action that's measurable, and we know whether we've done it or not. Does that make sense? Sure. And and they know what they are. They're, yeah. So they're building like a movie, uh, um, uh, a strong topics movie series through John Germain Library, which now they've made a partnership with. They're building uh, K through six uh, classroom reading library, so that when a child opens a book. They're looking at other cultures and other um, folks from not only around the world, but you know, city folks, country folks, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, and then they're also um, building a, a presentation series so that everybody's hearing this over and over and over again. Well, and, and maybe we need to survey students to see if they feel like they are in a place that's welcoming, welcoming and respected if they're from a diverse population. Because I know that I know some parents of, of children that are um, that are fall into some of those populations, and some of their kids feel welcome, and some of their kids feel really unwelcome. And so, again, we don't know how some of these kids feel and what they're experiencing. I think there's anecdotal stuff, but but 
maybe we want to survey, maybe that's a step two to survey and get a baseline. But I also think, um, I feel Bobby saying about it being like subpart B of section two, that like I think maybe, I think looking at this holistically a little bit and just, we don't need to kind of stay with the same format mm -hmm. for everything. Like this could be its own section. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. Yeah. yeah. To just give it more importance. Yeah. All right, so it sounds like uh, that's where we're going with the goals. So we'll look out for a draft from you that we can provide some feedback to. Got it. And then we can discuss it publicly at the next meeting and either and adopt it then or at the following meetings. Right. And then maybe, if, you know, we can have, if, if we can get the first draft, if we can get the draft of that early enough, maybe that can be posted publicly that Thursday or Friday before the meeting so the public will have a chance to, so that they, if they want to come, they can come in. But according to one of those goals, I have a safety and security meeting at Anna Gansett tomorrow. So, about our radios. So, that I don't have to. <laughs> yes, sometime this week. Yeah, sometime this week. I'll work on my thing. Yeah. Um, all right, can I get a motion to reconvene the business meeting? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Do we need to can I get. Uh, do we need to vote electronically? Yeah. It's all set up. I just set it up. Um, I hate to do this to everybody, but can I get a motion to go into executive session to discuss the employment of a particular person just for like a few minutes before we come back? So we'll be fast. It'll be fast. It'll be very fast. Um, can I just, I, can you guys just? Yep. Oh, we'll, we'll have, have to vote on it. Okay, so Jordan, you move the motion. I do. And second. Oh, I don't see Okay. 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 to reconvene from the executive session. Second. Sorry, did you get that? Yep. It's coming up. Mr. Bogus. Uh, I just have one thing when you go into consent that I want to let you know. Um, on item number... Uh, 6.7, uh, Point Barbara Jones, uh, the date will be as of tomorrow, not August 27th. Okay. Um, and so just before it we says go, through August 13th. I, I changed it, but if you looked at it before right now. Awesome. Uh, and before we go into consent, I just wanted to denote that the agenda is slightly, I, I emailed the board earlier, sure. but just for the yes. public knowledge, the, the agenda is slightly, um, shorter than was originally posted. Um, and that's because we wanted to focus on goals and turns out that was the right move since it's already almost 9.30. So um, a bunch of the stuff that was not time sensitive is going to be moved to the next meeting and so that we have a shorter agenda today. Um, can I get a motion to approve item 6.1 through 6.7? So moved. Second. It just worked for the other one. I know. That's the weird thing. It just worked for when I came back to add an exam. Do you want to try and resend it one last time? Yeah. No. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.
unanimous thank you. Someone like to make a motion to approve item 7.1. So moved. Second. Any discussion? No. Is this any different than last year's schedule? Yes. Um, we added, um, remember all the board discussion about the PM route for Peterson Middle School High School. We did add an additional route for Peterson Middle School High School, um, hopefully to reduce our overall costs. So the schedule is different? There is an, there's an additional a second route, route so for the ac for the afternoon. Remember there was there's an extra bus in the afternoon to right. so have. Okay. So it should be less bus time for a lot of folks if you were adding a route. Yep. Mm -hmm. Terrific. So so when we communicate this out to everybody, can I make a suggestion? Like if it's emailed out in the title of the email, the subject, it shouldn't just say message about transportation, it should say it's a new routes. Right. <laughs> new routes and times so that people actually open it and pay attention and they're not standing there waiting for bus that doesn't play. And it, right, and it's just for the high school, middle yeah. school. Right. Did you guys get the problem this yes. time? Yes. Okay. okay, that's unanimous. Thank you. Can we get a motion to approve item 7.2? So move. Second. Any discussion? Can you, can you give just a one minute on what this means? Sure. Some people may not be familiar. Um, so um, we've been having what they call APPR plans or annual per, uh, performance review plans um, going back a number of years. This year, the intent was to revise the plans. However, our Commissioner of Education um, has decided to um, re uh, resign rather abruptly. So this won't be updated. So we're just simply rolling over the plan that was written. Mr. Nichols, Mr. Malone, the plan is what, this is its fourth year, right? It's, oh, it's, right. yes. This is the same plan we used. Last year yeah, so we're early. simply, it's a, it's a rollover of our plan that we um, send the results to, to New York State. Um, and we use our Regents exams and our free grit free testing for, for our overall. Um, all right. 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 A little more complicated. Than that, I'm being very simplistic, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. But we're not, it, this was the year, if you would have heard, months ago um, I was saying that we would be changing and making uh, changes to this but um, New York State Department of Education sent out that that was a hard no um, and but they still are asking for it to be sent immediately to New York State so that's why I put it on for, for an urgent um, approval okay that's unanimous thank you I get a motion to approve item 7.3 um, establishing the teacher position for ENL K through 12 English as a second language. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Um, it's unusual for us to have a position created and to be appointing the, per the person that's filling it on the same night because usually you create a position and then it gets posted and then there's interviews and there's a time frame. Um, was this in the this year's budget? Yes. It was yep. in the, I just want to yep. confirm that. Yep. And w when was this initially posted? It was posted. Um, Mr. Nichols, we yeah. post that at the end of the year. Yeah. Yep. yep. I think pretty much after the budget. Talk in the budget meeting, and like also it's just because of ESL change from ESL to ENL. Okay. Yeah. So, so my my request is that if it was posted months ago, then we this should have been on agenda in the spring, so that we actually made it a position that could be posted, and we could when we do a search for the position should be created before we're doing a search, right? So I would just request going forward that. Before we advertise for a position, we actually have it in the district and have it created as yeah, a board. I, and right? that was probably an oversight on my part. This was included in the budget presentation that we made right. under new staff. Mm -hmm. we, so we did present it to you, but we didn't take the next step to create it. Right. So, because I just think it helps then it becomes official yes. that it's been created. Yeah. And then, just we've done this before, and I didn't see it this time for us, but um, I think it's helpful just as a practice that. We get the job description when we are establishing a new position that in our in our um, board docs to have a job description as a document that we can review before we vote on it. Is this a request going forward? Thank you. And do you think that I gotta ask a clarifying mm -hmm. question just so I'm clear. So if we're adding a, a I understand that if it's a new administrative position or something like that, but mm -hmm. for a teacher seven through twelve in social studies, you want a job description? Was well, this a this is a new position, not a position that's right? It's an ENL position. 
But we have, we so have the NL teacher. Yeah, the reason why we had to put it on, I thought this was correct, we had to put it on because it changed from English as a second language to English as a new language. And also we have, a, we have an elementary position, mm -hmm. we have middle school, high school positions, but this is the first kindergarten through 12th grade position mm -hmm. we have. So that's what makes it I mean, we new. Do, yeah, we, we do have teachers who spread their time between the two buildings. And that's uh, sort of a fluid situation. So we have shared art teachers. We have <coughs> shared music teachers. And in this instance, the need is for help across both buildings. Right. And I'm not trying to be difficult. I just no. want to make sure that I understand the roadmap moving mm -hmm. forward. <coughs> an additional teacher in a tenure area, you want a job description. The, the, and we could, we could have this philosophical debate. The, the recommendation, the best practice from NISBA says that when a new position is created, not that you're replacing a current one, but a brand new position is created, that um, it, it, you should have a job description or, or do our um, statement of duty for it. But I'm just going to. Um, but if it's if we have others in this position and this, we're just filling in other women, I guess that's different. Because we do have ENL, or mm -hmm. it's now ENL, right? But we had the, them in the elementary, we had them in the high school. Now we have one that's going to be very limber and be able to, you know, be. In, be in both the elementary and the high school. Okay, open a vote. Okay, that's unanimous. It didn't pop up. <coughs> you voted. Okay. The position, we can get to that first. Oh, the first. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can I get a motion to approve item 7.4, approving Tara O'Malley as English as a new language teacher? So moved. Second. Four seconds. Okay. Any discussion? I should have said no. Okay. Open the vote. Okay, that's unanimous. And she happens to be in the audience. Congratulations. <laughs> in a substitute position and she has just been a real favorite um, to the students and made tremendous gains with them so we're so glad to have her. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah. thank you. Welcome. Okay, um, moving on to, uh, to section eight, just a few topics to that we can kind of go through fairly quickly, especially since we don't have the full board here. Um, one of the items that came out of our retreat was a suggestion that we have separate internal board goals. Um, and so, um, you know, I want to just use this as a, an opportunity if there's anything that anyone in particular wants to suggest or we can have it as part of another workshop. Um, I personally liked the goal that was suggested of, you know, going through our policy book and making it a practice of going through like a fifth of it each year so that over the course of five years we can update it. Um, that was one that I thought was, was a good one. I don't know if anyone else had any thoughts. I have a couple, but I would actually suggest tabling it since we're missing. You should have the whole board. Yeah, I think yep. we should have the whole board. Yeah, I just want to so, tee it up. So, mm -hmm. but and, okay. and perhaps it might make sense if you solicit from the board some ideas ahead of time that okay. we could start with an outline, start with starting from scratch, and yeah. then we can kind of expedite the conversation. Sounds good. Um, then the next is just board committees. I wanted to just remind everyone, since we're on camera, that anyone who wants to join a board committee should express their interest to Victoria by September 9th, um, with the exception of the audit committee, which we just um, created for this year. And so, if, is there anything else anyone wants to say about that? Okay. Um, board workshops, also something that I wanted to get your thoughts on. Um, it sounds like we need to have a board workshop on, because we're going to have the format where we're going to have once a month business meetings and once a month um, workshops. It sounds like you know measuring success and what kind of data might be a really good workshop to have earlier on in the year. Um, but just you know, I had created some placeholders for workshops with with some ideas that I had thought of. But mm -hmm. I you know, and anyone that wants to weigh in totally should, and we should then set them so that anyone that we want to present on certain things can actually start yeah, preparing and get ready. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've had, uh, several years ago, we had a couple that were educational, um, very specific educational workshops that were really helpful. I think there was one, and it might have been five or six years ago, that was on our foreign language program as an example. 
Um, but one of the benefits of it being workshop, it was just more interactive and we got much more feedback from the community on it, which was very constructive. So um, there may be some where the administrators might have some ideas where instead of giving kind of a one-way presentation and fielding questions, it might be this is one that might make sense. So I would welcome their input as well. Um, yeah, so I guess how email. do we want to, yeah, uh, maybe, email you yeah. Know, topics we're interested in, and, yeah. and, and, and feel more comfortable out. emailing Katie, email Katie. Yeah. Or any topics the administration yeah. wants to discuss. Yeah. And, it, and this is something that if we ever do a survey of parents, as an example, we could ask, are there certain topics you'd love to have a workshop yeah. on? Yeah. Um, just to see what they're looking for. Okay. Um, and item 8.4, the superintendent search. I just wanted to give an update that school leadership is going to be here on September 16th and 17th, meeting with various um, stakeholder groups. They'll also be at our meeting on September 16th. Um, so we're going to put together letters to the various stakeholder groups to um, schedule the times to meet with school leadership for those days. I just wanted to tee that up so that groups that get those letters don't they, they know what it's about. Um, there's also a survey that's going to go out to the public. Um, it's already live, but um, we'll send out an email blast to the community with a link to that survey. Um, anyone else wanted to say anything about this? No. I do Oh, and then... Um, we, do you want to go to... Is that part of items for discussion, or do you yeah. want to go into? Okay, so I guess um, we'll add to the items for discussion just a quick update yeah. on Sag Harbor Learning Center. Yeah. Okay. Um, Tim didn't bring his glasses, so I'm doing reading for him. I think everyone remembers Tim Balker from, and I'm going to get the acronym wrong. C CNS. CNS. Look at that construction management company. So. Um, our architects and engineers, the IBI group, and CNS is our construction group. Um, so we just brought you, um, Tim was good enough to take some pictures and he'll give the verbal update and um, I'll do it. I want you to know I'm outpacing one technology. I know. I, I thought it was because he didn't have his glasses. I, I can't see. I, I can see here, right? Yeah. Same thing. So, uh, wait, I'll, um, so what I have just pictures of from Tim is um, for the abatement for all the building um, levels and auditorium have been completed along with needed air quality and safety testing. The major electrical work um, is largely um, current. Major plumbing work is in place for the project, including the kitchen and all the bathroom, toilet fixtures, and sinks. It is not glamorous though. The major plumbing and electric is done, and when I walk in with my construction eye, I can see that it's all done and over, covered over. But when you walk in, the bathroom and toilet fixtures, you're still waiting on the tile to put the toilet and the sink in place. So um, there's parts that are not glamorous still. Uh, playground equipment will be put in place as soon as the base finishes in. Um, the elevator exterior, which we're gonna have pictures for all this, are is near completion and it's beautiful how closely they've matched the brick when you see it it's really something cosmetic work on um, um, it will finish off the large group instruction room which is huge and the business office suite um, that work has to be done but all of the rooms are are beautifully in place but now they just have to do the finished work um, the classrooms are waiting for the installation of uh, the custom door frames um, which ha came with substantial safety hardware because um, you have to be plugged into every single room. And all the roofs, um, including the auditorium, um, are all newly finished. So I'll let you, can you see those pictures? I can. <laughs> <laughs> so th again, this is Tim Balker, and if you have, um, he'll give you the updates. Tim and I get to see each other pretty much every day. Uh, this is the new switch gear that's going in. Um, the electrical room downstairs, um, like like uh, Katie said, probably 80 to 85 percent of the electric is done. We just need hookups. Um, the uh, plumbing is similar, about 80 85 percent. 
Um, same thing, we're working on getting the finishes done so we can get the uh, fixtures in and get those hooked up. Um, the <coughs> this is a picture of the outside of the roof on the auditorium. Uh, last weekend they finished up that roof and put the gutters on. Um, in the back corner you can see um, the flat roof um, is going to be done this weekend. They're going to trim that out and finish that out so it matches the rest of it. Um, we put in, in conjunction with that, they finished uh, the downspouts and gutters on the main building um, that they started uh, in June. <coughs> This is downstairs, uh, going to be the business office. Um, looking down the hall uh, towards the, uh, on the right hand side is uh, going to be a conference area or work area um, and some casework and uh, other items are going there for a workstation. Got one more for you on the business suite. This is looking the other way, um, down the hall. Um, this is our impromptu offices. We got kicked out upstairs, so now we're down in the basement. <laughs> um, this just shows you that the walls are up. Uh, we're waiting on doors to get installed. The painters are coming towards the end of the week. They're going to start priming those walls and get some paint on the walls. Uh, this is the area that Katie was just talking about. This is the conference room or training room. I um, call it large through constructional space. So downstairs, I, if you remember the planning stages, we could not have classrooms in the, on the bottom floor. We could have offices, but you could have large group instructional space. So students could go down there and they could have um, instructional space, but you couldn't consider it a classroom. Um, you could have, and this room is expansive because um, they got rid of the windows, um, which you would be, um, you're looking at the, into the hallway, but if you're looking the other way, um, there used to be windows and those have been steeled up. So there's two big entrances into this room and it is quite expansive and it's right off the commercial kitchen. Um, so again, it, you, you're seeing the ceiling and you're seeing the floors, but the flooring and those, and those kind of items go pretty quickly, but all the, all, it's been all framed up and it's quite, I'm pretty impressed with it. Yes. They are installing the framework for the ceilings this week um, and the ceiling tiles on site. Um, the, uh, the rest of that building, or the rest of this room, um, Scott was working on to put a TV at each end, I guess, for instruction. They're going to split the room in half, or at least attempt to, I think, is the plan. Um, and it's it's going to be a nice room when uh, you get that done. This is another shot of that. That's the is the room going to be, is it a permanent wall, or is it one of those retractable? No, it's good. Well, actually, that hasn't been in our plans, but futuristically, we know that's going to be a demand that we have, we are not, we don't, we oh, there is, but we're not putting a wall there now. No, no, we no. just want to eventually have a, Supporting it, yeah, because it's a such a it's such a big space and has two separate entrances. Right. So, yeah, and it's really neat. Um, they've made it so. Um, this is just the detail, so that if anyone were to rent the space, they can swipe into the building, swipe into the second entrance, and swipe into this large group instruction, and they don't need any of us. So they would be given a code to enter the building, use this space, and. They, and it records how long they've used the space and that they've gained entry, but they don't need any of us. So it's just a secured entrance, like just for after hours. Yeah, yeah. And it's or separate even, from the classroom space yeah, at all. Yeah, so all have access to that. Yeah, no, yeah. it's all separate. The That's whole smart. the whole entry system because it's just it's just a great space. Yeah. These are a couple of pictures of the gym. The one on the left as before. Um, now the floor has been abated. Um, the ceilings are tore out. The grid work is out. Um, and this space
space is ready to be revamped. We're working on that now. We have some stuff staged in there. Um, the carpenters have come this week to start the framework on the ceilings. Um, we picked the paint out last week. Um, and that's going to move along. Um, we're going to wait a little bit. Um, we have some casework coming this next week and the following week. We're going to stage in that area because we're limited on space. Um, but after that casework is put up, we'll do the floors and finish up the rest of that. Um, and that space will be ready in the auditorium. Well, I thought I had... I didn't see the... Um... The outside one? Yeah. Oh my gosh, all this time. When is, when is the playground going in? I saw, I saw one of the glow points the was the base 19th, has to go first. The 19th, the, mm -hmm. um, the elevator is going to get set. And then the following week, that during the week of the 19th, we're going to finish the grade work in the playground area. The playground is scheduled to be paved the following week of the 26th. And then the playground will be installed shortly after that. Um, they are scheduled to come to to start installation of the playground. Okay. I'm so sorry. I will send it in my Wednesday letter, the, um, the pictures of the... The break they, they come out for it, it looks, it'll, 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 You can't tell in at year, all. It'll blend right in. If you clean the building, it'll, it'll match pretty well. Yeah. yeah. So any other questions? So Sorry to throw that in there, but um, you guys are wait. We'll so is there a latest update of when everything is going to be completed? I have a date. It's it's uh it's August twenty eighth. Or we're we're not gonna have friends on Long Island with our contractors. <laughs> That's all. We yep. um one of the things I requested, so maybe we can get this in the next few days, and we, we used to get this with previous bond projects, was that, that you know, I know you've got a spreadsheet with like the steps and the dates or whatever of, of stuff being done. They they don't have that for this project. We just have the and no project we, management and we documents. Didn't, we didn't used to send that to the board. For uh, I can forward you the ones I used to get. As okay, so do that for me because yeah. we didn't do that, and we did. Mm -hmm. I didn't. The only thing we have is construction meetings, and we don't. We don't spend the construction meetings. I, I didn't. Yeah. We can send you, like we can create a progress report. I'm not, I don't want anything created. It was just that, you know. We have a progress meeting every two weeks, mm -hmm. and I have minutes from those meetings. If you like those, sure. I have. We don't do a monthly report, so, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, some projects we do, some projects we don't. I don't think those are board level, though. Those have never been board level, and uh, we, uh, made a, we yeah. made a point of not so making construction <coughs> meetings board level. I'm not asking for any document that doesn't exist. It's, it's, it's more just having an understanding of what's happening when and when the completion is. And we've had a limited amount of information. There's a very limited amount of current information on, online uh, on our website. So, but I'll send you, and it may predate you, because. You know, I was, I've been on the board for a while, and uh, before my time, right before my time, there was actually a board member on the bond project committee, and then they went to sending these charts, and over the past several years, we've just gotten less and less kind of concrete information. So, so this I, is helpful. I was, I, I, mm -hmm. I ran the, the, mm -hmm. the, we didn't have facilities manager, and I mm -hmm. ran the project, and I gave mm -hmm. the board all the updates we had, yeah. but we had, it was a much bigger, broader project, mm -hmm. so we were getting monthly updates from Mike Milwaukee on mm -hmm. here's where we are in each phase of the project. So what's the plan now? So pre-K is still going to be in the old building until this is finished and then we're going to transfer them over? Our plan is for them to start in this building. That's our plan. In and September? Mm-hmm. Um, and are we accepting nursery or not? We are, we have, uh, it, the, I sent the board, um, I think it was Saturday, the um, draft of an RFP, a request for proposals, that that will go out to uh, um, potential daycare providers this week, but I wanted to show the board the draft of it. Um, so that, we gotta fill in all the blanks, but I wanted to see if the board had any feedback on that. Um, but that'll go out to, later this week, to potential and then that, if they've got a set of days to respond. I think we put it out for five, but we they may want to put it out for longer than that. Yeah. So then, the when will the business offices be moving over? Because then that frees up the 
middle school wing, and the original conversation was that the <coughs> line of work that had to be done there was going to be done there during the summer before kids started. So a real priority, and I've asked um, um, Carriero to put the brakes on that because my our, my priority absolutely is the get the, the school the daycare space. Yeah, yeah. The it's, daycare or the pre-K? I mean, sorry, the, I'm sorry, I said it wrong. The, the pre-K. That. So the business offices won't be moving there before school starts. It's going to be sometime this fall. Don't tell the contractors that. I've told the contractors. Okay. Look at his face. What have I told the contractors? Twenty years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds good. So if they're watching, take that part out of the video. Too. <laughs> they're there working now. Yeah. Well, they're working. Yeah, it's going to be beautiful. It really is. The it's beautiful. It really is. It's look. It's starting to take shape. Yeah. And I really appreciate that the board went through with, this was never part of the project, but this space is just gorgeous for so many, many things. This, um, you know, and if you look back on how it started, it, it, it was very, very dated. Um, if you look at the ceiling, the lights, the flooring, um, and it, it's already coming together. It's just a really big, beautiful space, so. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's nice to spend all that time with you, Tim. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Um, before we do public input two, I just want to get that one last um, potential item not scheduled. Can we get a motion to accept item 10.1? So moved. Second. Two is showing up, but we already did that. Um, so, is there anyone here for public input two? Before we begin, before we convene, oh. can I just um, make, make, make mention of two things coming up? Yep. Just because they're going to happen before we. And our athletic director isn't here, but preseason for uh, JV varsity starts Monday, August 26th, which starts the day that we have a meeting that night, except for football, which start which starts earlier. Um, and I just did this so I'm going to remind people they have to sign up online for the student ID stuff. And then separately, we've had a couple of conversations publicly about some equipment being stall, st installed and a, a plaque and a, uh, someone's name in the back. And I, the board voted to fund some of the project, but then asked that the organization go and raise some money. Well, they have a fundraiser this Sunday in Bridgehampton. So I, I, um, and I don't really remember the, the location, but it's this coming Sunday. Um, and I think we've got some uh, high school students who are volunteering their time to work there. So Do I, they have um, like a GoFundMe website or something? That I, I, have, I have no idea, but if I get information on the fundraiser, I'll email it after the board. All right, um, anyone here for public input two? It's not appear so. Can I get a motion to, well, I think administrators can go home, but can I get a motion to convene executive session? So sure. I want to say for what? Oh, for the, regarding the employment of particular persons. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh. Well, I have Chris and Brian. Yes. 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 Thank you. Hold on. Okay, it's open. Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.